All right, uh, good morning. Uh, can you all hear me on uh, Zoom? Good, excellent. Right, we'll uh, open the meeting and we'll uh, go on to agenda item number one, which is declaration. Any members who have any interest, please declare them now. Don. Item number two on the agenda, uh, to approve a correct record of the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of January. Have a proposal? Yes, Second, all in favour? Okay. Right, I'd now like to welcome Liam Plunkett, who's uh, of the Humberside Fire and Rescue Service, who's going to give us a PowerPoint demonstration uh, and an update, which will be followed by members' questions. Uh, over to you and uh, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Sykes. Um, everybody in the room, hear me okay? I take it we're going to have sound checks online, so we're good to go, yeah. Uh, Jess, if you could put the PowerPoint up, please. <coughs> Great stuff. Right, firstly, good morning, all. Uh, thank you for the invite today. Thrilled to be here. It's nice to meet you all. Um, quick positive background. Uh, I worked well on this, but you, for those of you who haven't met before, which is most of you, uh, I'm now um, Service Delivery Manager for the East Riding as of the 1st of January. Um, I'll go into some details on what that looks like in a minute, but um, I'm East Riding, born and bred. I was raised in Willoughby, where my parents live. I've got five children, um, lived around the, the district, but now reside in Swanland. Uh, my young children go to the schools there. Uh, I've got 29 years service, Humberside Fire Rescue, uh, 19 of those are operational. Um, fairly recently, I've, I've worked previously at most of the stations across the whole service. Uh, I've worked under Niall McKinry, for those of you who remember Niall, and, and one of my lead projects in that period was rolling out the medical major response across 11 stations in East Riding. Also, more recently, I worked for Dan, the station manager with a cluster of stations. Um, the crucial part there is that I had the opportunity to build some really sort of positive and strong relationships with the station management teams and, and individual watch managers. Um, so I've got a good start with that. Um, more recently, I was head of emergency preparedness fleet and equipment based at service headquarters over in Hesel. Uh, as the name suggests, it's a really broad remit that is, but if you think about the toys we have as a service, so any appliances, new vehicles, green fleets, any equipment, all the national resilience stuff, so our capabilities for marine response, uh, responding to marauding terrorist attacks, anything like that, that is my responsibility to make sure we're fully prepared and ready to deal with those situations. Rolled out NOG, the, the new and recent uniform work where that was a nice thing as well. So um, after the meeting, if there's any any of detail, you, any council, anybody re re require about that, I'm more than happy to, to uh, show and tell or, or invite you down to the station to see that stuff. So very much a people person, absolutely see the power of the team and, and what, what that can bring. Um, very, very much looking forward to working with you all and, and in improving and, and building on the relationship we've already got um, and benefiting the, the community to make a difference to those people. So without further ado, I'll get into the detail and the performance bit, which is, is what I'm here for. Um, so performance stats. So um, as you can see, I need my glasses for that. As you can see on there, we have, oh, it's, there's quite a lot of text on there. So just a quick overview of that. We have a twice a year performance and risk report. Okay. Uh, running, the first one is April to September. Um, it's presented to the fire authority and published on the uh, web, our website. Uh, it covers, amongst other things, the, the performance indicators that I'm going to um, update you on this morning. So high severity dwelling fires, total deliberate fires, and so on and so forth. And the second report of the year is October to March. Um, that includes all of the above, but also some other bolts on there's health and safety environment, finance, health and well-being, and so on and so forth again. So high severity dwelling fires, okay? That is all I've got on that slide, which in, its, in essence is a good news story. You could argue that one, one incident is one too many, but um, I'm pleased to report on that. There has only been one high severity dwelling fire during the period 21-22, and that was back in May 21 in North Ferriby. Um, the serious incident review was not required. Um, the crew was offered the safe and well to the occupants, but was declined. Uh, it was found that on that particular incident, it was a fault in electrical supply caused an extensive fire. There's no casualties, I'm pleased to report. 
Uh, the occupier witnessed that there was a fire starting in the upstairs, electrical fuse burning in the bedroom, which had caught fire occupants, all escaped unharmed. So total number of fires, just a bit of a refresh for those who have seen it before, or anybody new to this meeting who wonders what that's all about. Uh, almost a corridor approach. If you look at the purple line running from left to right across the centre, that's our average over a period of three years. Um, the red line is our upper um, threshold for anything significant. And likewise, the green at the bottom, as you'd expect, is anything significant below that. These thresholds are important. Um, anything above the red, clearly, that's important. We need to scrutinise it and have a look, closer look at what that looks like. And same as below the, the threshold, below the average, because we need to make sure we're putting our resources in the right places at the right times. So the total liberal fires on there, see on there, it's below the average threshold each month, other than October, where you can see a spike there. Um, October, the incidents were made up of five vehicle fires, two commercial, two deliberate, which were prison cells, um, three others, which included containers and, and bales of hay. Um, there's absolutely no reason for us to believe that any of those incidents were connected. Deliberate incidents, of that nature, they're shared with Humberside Police, Antisocial Behaviour Partners, and the ASB team, that's managed by uh, Nigel Brignall as part of the East Friday and Yorkshire Council. His team worked closely with, with the police delivering investigation and intervention across the district. Accidental dwelling fires. These always see an increase during the colder months, as we'd expect, with more people being at home, cooking hot meals and warming the homes and such like. Um, this year, seen the most incidents in three years, and that is suggested to be linked to the pandemic uh, and more people staying in the home setting. Data shows that those over the age of 65 years are more likely to be involved in a fatal fire, more prevalently starting in the kitchen. French and teams were supplied a data set from NHS at the start of the pandemic, a list which identified those households where the over 80s lived. Safe and, well, uh, safe and well visits were offered by advocates and crews to over a thousand, sorry, 1,600 households across the district. That's 1,600. Delivery secondary fires, okay, mostly below the average other than April 21, where there was exceptionally high in all districts across the service. The weather was really warm and dry, and that acts as an enabler for this type of incident. 30% of this type of incident uh, in the historic hotspot we have between Hull and East Riding Boundary there, Cottingham North, and mainly involved loose refuse, grassland and trees. Extensive interventions carried out between partners in the area, and this is an area of high demand for all emergency services and local authorities. Incidents in this area usually see an increase during the school holidays. That indicates that these are starts by use of a schooling age. Uh, we've got advocates who will be carrying out patrols during the Easter holidays to help mitigate that increase. I'll talk a bit about the drones at the end of the presentation, and I'm looking at introducing our drone asset into that area for a number of reasons, really. One, I think it'll act as a possible deterrent. The imagery on it that we, we, we use with the police is, is really useful, but I think from more of an educational point of view in our schools and stuff, so I'll be looking to introduce that in the coming weeks. Uh, false alarm, non-domestic. Um, these have been a downward trend since October. Um, COVID-19 will have influenced these incidents as before businesses were closed. This means responsible person may not have been available to investigate the false land before we were, we were notified and called. Our control consistently challenged 32%. Currently, a false alarm as per our unwanted fire signal policy and the charging policy, which is a relatively new concept, continues to use a mechanism to deter and, and prevent false alarm activations. HMIC FRS, you'll be aware, I'm sure that we've just come on the back of uh, quite an intensive period with the six week period with the inspectors from HMIC. Um, again, quite a lot of text on there, I don't propose to go through all of it, but as you can see, it was a six week timetable. It started off with a strategic briefing and a meeting with the, um, the HFA chair some reality testing and external partners. So police, health and estates and other partners, a bit of a 360 that for us, uh, engaging and, and the inspectors went to speak with partners who we collaborate with to see what, what they thought of us and how their experience is. I got involved in week three, major incident, and week four, I chaired the LRF interoperability group, or certainly did them do my last um, role. Um, 
if we're going to say compositive on the Bridgewood uh, fire plastics um, factory, it would give me plenty of evidence to talk about with the inspectors. We was, I was being interviewed on major incident. Um, we'd just had a major incident just prior to the interview. So the inspectors are keen to know how the, our policies, procedures, and everything's aligned and how we actually respond on the day when it counts. So that, that was um, useful evidence for that. That was a breakdown of the, the um, what we did during that period. A number of interviews, 24, desktop reviews, 16, staff form, 6, reality test, 11. Um, number of documents submitted, 201, and number of staff approximately spoken to, 156. Um, just the way it works, they do, um, they do desktop appraisals, they look at our policies and procedures in advance, and then the re reality testing is boots on the ground. They'll go see people on a day-to-day -day basis in the workplace, and that's when they try triangulate the evidence that we provided to make sure it all fits. Inspection debrief, we had limited feedback. Um, it was focused on the three inspection pillars of people, efficiency and effectiveness. Provisional feedback included an acknowledgement of the improvements we've made across the, the three inspection pillars since the last inspection. Now land some limited areas that require further improvement, but the feedback on the whole was very positive, a positive direction to travel over as acknowledged. Having said that, and this is the caveat, we are now waiting until May when the full the, the report will be published. We won't know what that rate is until we receive that. Service improvement plan. Also known as the SIP, it was initially created to manage the 17 individual areas of improvements, which were again eight effectiveness, one efficiency, and eight people. And that was identified in the first inspection report. The SIP was used during the inspection program to demonstrate the progression that our service had made against the improvement themes, as stated in the debrief I've just mentioned, positive about progress made by the service, which has been articulated and managed through the SIP. Uh, many of the improvement themes in the SIP have now either been completed or they've been transitioned now into business as usual. And after completion of that inspection, the SIP will now be subject to review and refresh. We're going to expand on its effective application over the last three years and include planned publication onto the services website. Integrated Risk Management Plan, the IRMP. This is going through some change at the moment, which I'll, I'll give you a quick overview. So the IRMP and the strategic plan. So the IRMP is a mandated requirement for all fire rescue services, and that's published in the Fire and Rescue Service National Framework. Um, it follows a three-year cycle, which includes a public consultation process that helps inform the content. Um, service strategic plan, that sets out the objectives to achieve the IRMP. That's also included as part of that consultation process. Um, the, the current um, consultation that ran from 9th of September uh, 2020 to 11th November, with a total 759 respondents, 351 of which were East Riding residents. The IRMP includes icons which denote where the content has been informed and or supported through consultation. Um, it is a live document. It is meant to be read in that way. It's, it's, it's easy to navigate as well. Um, it's subject to change and managed against societal, uh, domestic, economic and geographical changes and or risk as they develop. Um, that is the change coming is we're going to transition to the community risk management plan. That's the compliance measure of the national fire standards. Um, it's currently an active piece of work informed through the national fire chiefs council working groups. Uh, brief COVID up, updates. A um, couple of images on there. Um, so from a sins, I was a pandemic manager in Humberside Fire Rescue Service. I've got no medical background. It is purely by default as I was the head of emergency preparedness, so in, in responsible for business continuity. Um, so our policy points to whoever's head of emergency preparedness would be our pandemic manager. So as you can imagine, incredibly busy period. Um, we had a number of teams. We, we've, we've been audited and inspected by uh, HMIC, FRS, post-pandemic, and the, the debrief and the feedback was excellent. Some of it being held up as best practice. Uh, nationally so that was good current state of play at the moment so our last influenza management team which took place at the end of february uh, we've created a task and finish group which is going to review the living with covid a plan which is published by the government um, we're keeping the current covid uh, measures in place um, until full alignment with the government guidance is likely to last till the end of this month um, at which time a new working slave recovery will come into effect from the first of, of april Updated information measure will be committed to all staff. 
Ukraine response, okay, um, you may have seen in, on social media and, and the like where our staff led donation centres have already established at Ghoul and Scunthorpe fire stations. You see Anna on the right uh, of that slide there, Anna Brzezinska, she's supported by Vicky Shapes. Anna's a Polish girl, um, she's got family in, out in um, Ukraine and, and we've got quite a large Polish community over in Ghoul. Um, They've been coordinating the Google efforts and it's, they've got some really, really good uh, arrangements in place for receiving and storing donated items without impact on our, our delivery. Um, and also tapping into those Polish communities. Um, that's been supporting the logistics element of that as well. So um, that's to be acknowledged in service. We're all proud of, of what our people have done and the contribution efforts provided support being fully acknowledged and staff are applauded for reacting so quickly and compassionately to the help of the people of Ukraine. As a service, we're going to continue to support the staff who set up the donation points, making sure donations go to the right places. Um, as a service, we support the UK government's nationally coordinated response under the Disaster Emergencies Committee. Um, we did preempt this, what's happened in the last few days. So we was expecting a, um, a request from the Home Office to supply kit and equipment. Um, and that has, and sure enough, that has come to fruition now. Uh, we've had a formal request um, through the National Resilience Team. As we speak, we have got staff, we sought volunteers, we've got staff loading. Um, we've, we've transitioned to a new uniform in the last few weeks, you may be aware, and all our surplus uniform, we have we have offered to donate that. So we are currently, as we speak, got staff loading HGV, which we'll be driving down to Kent tomorrow to send over. We have got uh, two volunteers who are driving a fire appliance, which we are donating to, to Poland. Um, and that will form part of a convoy of other fire appliances that have been donated from other fire and rescue services. Um, so that'll be a bit of a road trip starting on Monday. Um, our volunteers and drivers, they'll be registered with Fire Aid. It's a charity. Uh, they're responsible for the logistics and travel arrangements. I'll put these slides on because it's of interest to East Riding. Okay, so we've just bought um, two brand new vehicles. Um, we're committed as a service providing suitable and appropriate firefighting vehicles for our staff and accordingly strive to improve ways of delivering the service to our community. Um, when I was back in the, the fleet role, um, I investigated something more substantial than our, our present small tactical response vehicles, which looked like a, a bit of a pumped up um, pickup truck with firefighting capability, but nothing quite as large as the previous compact vehicles we have. So that's a bit of an in-between. It's a mid-sized vehicle. These are known as rapid intervention vehicles, RIVs or RIBs. Um, they're built by most fire-specific bodybuilders around the country, usually on a five to six ton chassis, as this one is, a, um, is just that on a Mercedes chassis, as you see. We paid 171,000 for the pair of them. Um, represents excellent value for money. Each one of those should have been 140,000 each. Um, Heathrow Airport had procured and purchased them and found the way suitable for their needs. Um, and we quickly jumped to the opportunity when it comes to market and grabbed them. Um, they're going to be strategically placed. Um, for me and us at the moment, what that means is we have crewing issues on our second appliance availability at um, Hornsea and Withensea. What these do, we're going to put them there on a temporary measure, and that's, that's the whole model where they'll sit in temporary structures it gives us different crewing options for those staff we've got available. So without reducing the fire cover, we've actually bolstered it and just gives us more options. Uh, there's no suggestion we're taking any fire appliance out of the system. It just adds to it and it gives us more scope when, when people are responding to the alerters. I put the drones on. I was, I was, that was one of my little projects, if you like, while I was back in EP and Fleet, and we talked about the toys. So if you look at this slide, the top three there so that's the journey of the drones the one on the left that was our original drone go back a few years the one in the middle um is the one that is just coming to end of life now that would be in partnership with the police with and the one on the right is a brand new uh drone uh, as is the one the smaller one in the front of the picture um that represents those two drones there represents an investment of thirty four thousand pound by the service it's looking likely that the police are reluctant to renew that arrangement um, because they're, they're exploring the potential of setting up their own drone teams. We fully support that approach. The project has worked really, really well. Um, it continues to gather momentum. Um, it continues to massively improve the way we respond to incidents. A great example of that, I could, I could talk about the um, Rawcliffe um, 
unexploded World War II bomb uh, that we had recently. Uh, military, we deployed the drone to that. The military would deploy the EOD, which is bomb disposal team. And ordinarily, they, they put the cordons in, as you'd expect, and that would have taken up the M62 in a hotel up, uh, close to where the bomb was. What the drone allowed us to do, we put the isochrone around using the imagery, and we managed to reduce, um, obviously in consultation with the military, with the reduce the cordon. It kept the road network running, and it kept the occupants in the hotel, which is a huge benefit to, to everybody concerned. So um, it's got really good support, and, and it's gathering momentum as we speak. That's attracted some additional funding from the local resilience forum, Al Bravey. Has, has offered some funding up and that's helped us buy some laptops and enhanced software to again enhance that model. So yeah, although the police might be dropping out of that relationship, I, the way I see it is it was our pilots, the, the fire pilots trained who would would operate on behalf of the police. It will impact us and I just can't see, I, I see that continuing to grow. And that is it. Okay, thanks for listening. Um, I would welcome feedback on the actual content of what I delivered because obviously a bit new to this and, you know, without putting you all to sleep, I hope, just any feedback. Was it pitched right? You know, open to take any any pointers and I'll take them away ready for next time. Thank all right, you. thank you. We're, we now move on to questions. And uh, the first question is from Councillor Green. Uh, uh, I do apologise for being late. Unfortunately, my link didn't work. I had to get a new link, so I'm sorry I'm late, but... I did want to declare an interest in the fact that I am a member of Humberside Fire and Rescue Authority. So I wanted Liz to make note of that. I just like, morning Liam, I'd just like you to maybe mention a bit more. We're sending this um, fire tender out to um, Ukraine. That's because we've managed to have a spare one because we are renewing seven tenders in our fleet. So I don't want anybody to think that we're going to be short of a tender somewhere. Could you maybe just explain that a little bit more? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Yeah, so part of our... Um, yeah, thanks for that. So part of our look forward... We're, we're, we have to be careful as we move forward by new appliances now because the, the roughly seven between 17 and 19 years in, in lifespan. So every time we make a decision to, to buy one, and they're not cheap, as you can imagine, somewhere in the region of a quarter of a million pounds, but it's a, it's a 17 and 19-year-old decision. So of course with the, with, with the hydrogen coming in the green fleet, so let's be really, really careful. So the council is absolutely right. This is an end of life vehicle. Okay, as we're looking to um, swap out buy new tenders, new appliances into the service. Um, and that's it really. Is that, did that cover it, Councillor, please? Yeah. Um, I also, you know, thinking about the environment and we're trying to look to have different vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, but just at the moment, they're not available to us because they're very, very expensive and don't do the job for us. So I don't want members to think that we're not thinking about the environment and choosing of our new tenders. Um, so, so thank you. again, no, thank you. So on that, you're absolutely right. We had a comprehensive report commissioned by the Energy Saving Trust done. Um, I've been to a number of seminars. Harrogate um, County Council seems to be doing quite a good job of... of, of pressing on with this and I gathered some really really useful stuff when I went to, to a, a conference up at Harrogate there um, you're absolutely right the infrastructure is not quite there we're at the end of an M62 and, and as you see there's a ripple effect coming out of London the great city where the infrastructure is already built it does make it difficult um, we are engaging with partners and our KCOM are doing some stuff um, our, our strategic leadership team the very very interested and committed to moving forward with this but the cost at the moment you're absolutely right is prohibitive um i was an increasing pressure as fleet manager as we were looking to procure new vehicles why aren't we looking at green why are we have we have bought our first green vehicles but again until that infrastructure is there you know we we, we, we can't we, we sort of hamstrung a little bit i'll come back in later thanks yeah thanks councillor Uh, next, question. next question from Councillor Scal. Uh, morning again, uh, Liam. Um, morning. Yeah, th thanks for that presentation, comprehensive. It was a good presentation, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, now, I don't know if it, there's lots of information in there, so I don't know if I've missed it or not, but um, it was about the future plans of the fire service. In March 2021, it was reported that the Chief Fire Officer 
was restructuring his senior team. And I just wondered if that's been done, how it's developing. Are there many changes at the top? Yeah, so thank you, Councillor. Yeah, there is some changes afoot. There's, um, there is a new structure that we're rolling out as we speak. Um, there's, we've still got quite a few temporaries, um, at group managers, certainly, and uh, area managers. We've, there's been a shuffle around, so I'll be in a better place to report um, at the next meeting, certainly. And in, if, if there's anything concrete between now and then, I can share that with members, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, if you can uh, possibly send something to Liz to some changes on a briefing note, just to let us know in between, between our next, uh, our next meeting. That would be okay. good. OK. Thank you. Yeah, OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Scar. Next question from Councillor Rudd. Uh, Liam, uh, yes, a very good presentation. No problem, uh, uh, as far as I, I could see anyway. Okay. Um, my, is, uh, my question is regarding the number of firefighters. Um, how many do you have, roughly? I mean, I'm not asking for the exact number, but, uh, you know, roundabout. And uh, how many vacancies? Yes, yeah, so the vacancies at the moment on call, the on call is predominantly in the East Riding. That's where we've got most of the stations we're relying on on call. We have, it represents roughly 35% of the, the, the firefighter makeup. And we do have shortfalls at on call. Recruitment is particularly challenging. Um, we have, we pride ourselves, we have, very, very high standards in terms of our fitness levels for coming into the service because we, we believe it provides longevity within the service. I suppose the downside of that is you do have to be physically fit to actually cut, get into the job and through the selection process. Um, we do look and we are actively looking at different ways of still demonstrating the VO2 max, which is your is, is sort of your fitness level. It's done at the moment on a bike with, with gas analysis. So we're, we're we're engaging, we're exploring other ways of achieving that. Um, recruitment is, like I said, on the on-call station, challenging. And we continue to drive forward, we continue to innovate. We're currently looking at when people um, express an interest in coming into our service, we now try and, and take them on the journey. So in other words, it's not just an application. If they fail at the first attempt, we try and continue that engagement and we try and work with them, work on the fitness and, and improve the chances of getting through. Um, but yeah, that is that is one of our biggest challenges. Well. Hence, um, the RRBs we talked about going out to Hornsey within C, that's crew deficiency on the second appliances. That's again linking back to recruitment. Not in terms of exact numbers, but I do know every single station we have, we have got we have got a shortfall. I'll send, I will I'll certainly get that number for the councillor. Yeah. Uh, next question from Councillor Jeffries. Uh, thank you, Chair. Follow, following on from Councillor Rudd's question, Liam, a recruitment of women. Can you give us some idea of what the problems are that you're encountering? Would it be just fitness or would it be uh, perhaps the lack of uh, candidates that come forward that perhaps don't see it as, as a viable career choice? I, th I think that's absolutely right. That second point there. So the we have a rookie red scheme where when females apply for the job, there's, again, they, they almost have a, they enter into a bit of a mentorship um, approach where we work on the fitness right from the start and everything else. But I do think that the, the second part of that question, it's almost like a perception. People look at it and think maybe it's not for them and it has to be ultra fit to, to actually come into the job. Um, it's, we're, trying to, we're trying to bust that myth, if you like. And I, you, you may have noticed some of the livery at the stations where we've got female firefighters. Actually, we, I've worked with some incredible female firefighters, um, all offering different things to service. It's, it's, it is really important. It is high up on the agenda, and it's something we're striving to it to be better at. But at the moment, it's a, it's a, it's a numbers game. It's a num it is really a numbers game. It's getting that initial interest. Um, to advertise and show that it is for all and it is inclusive. And then from there, it's engaging people to take them on that journey to make sure we can get them through the selection process. How are you advertising for women? So obviously our, our website, that's outward facing. All the, we've got vehicles liveried up. 
I'll be our future, which is a national campaign. We've, we've obviously um, adopted that approach and piggybacked on that. Um, our own stations, again, we've got livery up at the station where you might see in the outline figure the female firefighters doing CPR and also responding to alerts and stuff like that. Um, active social media marketing and stuff like that. Mm. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Councillor. Next question from Councillor Birch. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it, my original question was about the false alarms, but you've answered that in the presentation. So as everybody else has said, don't worry about the presentation. It was good. Um, if I may ask another question, Chair, in place yeah. of that. Um, so in terms of training the officers, so existing and new ones, how, how is their training developed to meet the needs of different, um, I want to say, customers or clients, people that use the service, victims, et cetera, in terms of if they've got a, like a disability or a different religious need or um, that may be going through a gender reassignment and they might need a female officer but it might not be present, that kind of thing. So what sort of training is delivered to them so they can understand better the different needs of different people? Yeah, that, that, that will very much be signposted through our um, safety teams. So uh, I think Councillor spoke earlier on, uh, Councillor Scow, Mel Presky has attended these meetings before. And at the moment, Mel sits as head of that that team in the East Riding. So that very much that sort of that sort of team is our advocates. Um, they would be focused on that, and it's that's that's their that's their area of business. If I'm being honest. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, the next uh, question is from me, Liam. Uh, it's it's on antisocial behaviour. Yeah. Uh, is it increasing, decreasing, stable? Yeah. What's the latest on it? So, I mean, the, the slide I put up about the um, deliberate secondary fire stock gives you a bit of an indication there. It's, it always tends to be little pockets that you see. So, obviously, historically, we've had the, the problem on the, the, the border with Hull and, and East Riding at not, uh, not crossing them there. Um, and then you probably, I'm fairly sure you would have seen in the, in the media relatively recently around bonfire night, um, the stuff on Gower, uh, Gower Road down on Boothry then, uh, just near Hesel there. And it is pockets. I mean, that's all I remember from my operational days in, in West Hill County. We was, we was often on that park. That seems to have never gone away. Um, and it is that you get you get like small pockets. Um, yeah, currently it seems to it seems to have leveled off. But like I say, that 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 boundary between Hull and East Riding does seem to be problematic. Yeah, and it does seem to be a drain on everybody's resources. Councillor Green, you've got your hand up. Thank, thank you, Chair. We lost the sound here on Zoom just a, a, a few minutes ago. Um, I was quite prepared to come in at the end. I'd just like to uh, maybe, Liam, we, we have a, a, a quarterly um, authority members, world councillors, obviously, meeting um, to discuss things happening in the East Riding. But you're more than willing to contact and be in contact with um, uh ward councillors if there is an issue of antisocial behaviour or anything within their wards they can actually contact you to be able to get information and support and we also have this um, telephone number that we can put up on the lamppost with a sign for antisocial behaviour if anybody views it could you maybe perhaps explain a bit about that yeah so again another initiative from mel's team it's we're open to any suggestions. If if it's a two-way relationship, this if that is something, if we've got little pockets and hotspots where we can we get stuff out onto lampposts, um, parish councils, and the rest of it. It's getting down into the detail, and 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 that is it. So any any initiatives like that would welcome. Talks a bit earlier about the the drone and and the benefits that brings. And again, for me, one of the quick wins on this hotspot we've got on the that border. It's a vast area that we know that, and that's part of the problem. Um, so certainly we'll, the imagery we get from that and the, the way we can increase our profile, I think those initiatives linking into that could be certainly benefit moving forward. Thank you, Liam. Councillor Greenwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, mine is just a question of, uh, remember the steelworks some time ago now? Uh, you didn't have sufficient, um, uh, what shall we say? Um, I've forgotten the word. 
we, we didn't have sufficient um, maintenance to cover that incident. And it was quite, it was quite severe in, in Scunthorpe. And you had to borrow from the West Riding to help you out. Now, could private business be included in this to help you get some funding to cover certain uh, um, things of this nature? Um, I'm not explaining it too well, but it was a very important thing for Hull Fire Service. And I felt that you didn't have sufficient funding to help you out. Is that now in place? And can you afford to maintain such specialised vehicles that you didn't have at the time? Well, well, thank you for the question, Councillor. Firstly, I'm not familiar with the, 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 the information and the finer detail of that incident. So I, I, I definitely need to know a bit more of that. What I would say is, we have the, the IRMP covers what assets we have in certain areas on response standards. That's covered in there. Um, we're continually reviewing our risk profiles and have the right, hopefully, the right resources and the right equipment, the right personnel suitably equipped and trained in the right areas. On top of that, we also have a mutual aid, um, which is Section 13, 16, Fire Service Act, where we've got a mutual aid where we do part of our plans has to rely on neighbouring by rescue services. Um, and that's what we, we tend to do. Our plans do feature that. Um, that's coordinated through a national control room. Um, a good example of that is, is spay, flood. Um, during the floods at Cowick and Snaith there, we, we, we had the H fit high volume pumps coming in. We, we, we received a, a number of them. Um, wildfires uh, over on the South Bank, we were sending resources into South Yorkshire. Um, our foam that we used to extinguish the fire at Bridgewood, that was a cracking example of some great work on the side, led on the foam procurement. Because um, we tend to be, we have the level of expertise, as you'd imagine, with all the coma sites we have on the, on the banks of the Humber. Um, so one of our officers led on that piece of work, we led regionally, and that foam, we, we hurled and store North Yorkshire's foam stock, and we will deploy it and operate into North Yorkshire if they have an incident like that. There's lots of separate arrangements, mutual um, understanding, but yeah, I need to know more about the details of Scuntop, so forgive me on that, I can't answer them until I can know that detail, but rest assured we have got the right resource in the right places for, for, with the socially trained people, and we have, we have some resilience built in with the mutual aid scheme. Well, thank you for that, it's reassuring, but I was quite worried for you all at the time, and uh, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Councillor Dewhurst. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your presentation, Liam. Excellent. Um, I wanted to discuss or explore flooding and your uh, capability of flooding response, which I know is absolutely crucial. Yep. Um, are you satisfied with the for the service's current capability and, and what you own? Is there more that you would like and there is there anything we can do as an authority to, to help that? Yes, uh, good question, Councillor. Thank you. Um, so DEFRET sort of dictates how many sort of floods craft on our resource initially, and that's what we end up giving. So they're, they're, they're do an appraisal and then they give us some assets to manage, train within the rest of it. So that's what we do. We, we train with that and we continually make sure our, we are one of the few services where every one of our firefighters is, is water rescue trained. So from a safety point of view, it's every one of our staff are trained for water rescue and there's two levels of that. There's water responder, which is a basic level and water technician where they will go into fast moving water. Um, then we have the boat operations, the boat operation stations with the accompanying equipment, which is like flood rafts and a whole raft, pardon the pun, of, of equipment that sits behind that. We don't receive any more funding from DEFRA to build on that capability. But what we do is we, we, we are cognizant as a service that things in certain areas maybe could be improved. So I'll get an example of that is we, we tend to do lots of um, mud rescues and water rescues in the River Hull, okay? Um, and we use the flood, we use the rafts that were supplied by DEFRA. So we just recently we procured a brand new craft, which is really quick and easy to deploy into the river. It's literally you can manhandle it or person handle it and it goes into the river quickly. We used to be relying on a slipway up at Kingswood and the crews would have to make their way down the river, which could, as you can appreciate, take some time. So we're always looking to improve and build. So again, to give a nod to the, the, the floodings and stuff we've had in our, on our patch, if you like, any operational debrief, would be key and operational assurance would flag up any deficiencies um, in our capability. 
And that's where the staff, the members of the public, the crews will feed back in anything that would cause us a problem or slow us down or hamper us or could be improved. And from the debriefs and from the operational assurance uh, mechanisms, out of there will come an action plan. And that's where people will be tasked with reviewing our procedures and, and enhancing anything that's deemed as deficient. To answer your question. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gateshill. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Liam, central government has recently been considering uh, expanding the role of elected police and crime commissioners to include the fire services. Uh, I don't know if you were aware of this, but uh, has your service as yet been consulted about this idea? And uh, what do you think about it? I honestly don't know the answer to that, Councillor. I mean, I, I'm looking up at the screen there, Councillor <laughs> Grinch. You might be able to answer that better than what I can. Yes, maybe she can. Yeah. I came by this information in November yeah. when I attended a conference at Warwick University for police and crime commissioner uh, panel members. And there was uh, a senior uh, civil servant came and explained that this was uh, uh, proposed for the future. And there's a passing reference to it in, the, uh, in our police and crime commissioner's uh, annual statement and forward plan. But it hasn't filtered down to you as yet. No. Perhaps the government's too busy with other things. <laughs> Possibly. But so perhaps Helen knows more about that, or perhaps she doesn't. Yep, Helen, do you want to? Yes, uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I do know quite a bit about it, and it's a, a very hot potato at the moment, but we're desperately waiting um, for the white paper to be released. We should have had that last July and then October then COVID put it back and it's imminent um, to be the end of February and now end of March. So I think when we get the white paper to see how the fire and rescue services are going to move on, we'll all know more about it. So um, it is the LGA fire conference next week up in Newcastle, which I'm sure it will be discussed there. But, um, you know, we actually think at Humberside Fire and Rescue Service that we actually do a fantastic job and we're at the, with the fire authority and the way we run the service as of the moment, we would prefer not to be having any change. Is that correct, Liam? Yes, thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Paul, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Chair, as, as Councillor Green mentioned, it's in it, the, these discussions have been taking some place, uh, taking place for some time now. Um, some areas have moved in that direction. Um, however, we are. You know, we are waiting to be cited on the decision from central government as to what's best for a locality. But I'm sure that we would also have a voice in determining the you know, best way forward. Next, next question from Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate the service on your, on your a wonderful, speedy and well-planned response to what's unfolding in Ukraine. I think everybody all the councillors, et cetera, would really congratulate you on, on, on that magnificent effort that you're putting in. I've just got a quick question on the RIVs, please, Liam. Um, you said that they've come from Heathrow. Was there any special equipment on there uh, that, that the guys need training on? Or um, is there anything which, which needs any special training from those uh, pieces of kit? Thanks, councillor. Good question. Yeah, certainly... The vehicles are two RIVs, they came um, without any kits on, um, which provided us with a really useful opportunity uh, when we were rolling out these to the crews because we're not replacing the fire appliance on the stations. It's complementary to what we've already got. So we could, we could look at the type of incident that we're responding to in those areas, engaging with our crews and just see if there's key bits of kit that, them, that might slight, be slightly different what we carry on a normal frontline appliance. As we say, it was largely the same. It was there was the only additional training required um, was around driver training. Obviously, the usual stuff like your driver familiarisation, the way the vehicle handles um, when driving to emergencies, and um, the way the pump operates at the rear of the vehicle, uh, different water pressure quantities, all that's the usual stuff you'd expect. But by and large, the equipment on them is is pretty much standard. Um, but we have got scope to tweak it if if we if we need to move forward. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. Councillor Green, you still have your hand up or? 
Yeah, I'll just put it back up again. I think one of the main reasons around the smaller vehicles was um, because it gave us much more flexibility with staff. And um, wasn't it, Liam? It was about being able to run that smaller appliance with lesser staff, but very, very safely for our residents. That's absolutely correct, councillor. So it's a very good point. And uh, I did mention it briefly. So I'll just give you an example. I'll pick a number out there. So if we had at one of these stations now, we've got two fire appliances sat there. If we had six personnel responding to the relators, we could only still before we could only take one fire appliance or one one engine to the job. Um minimum crewing on a frontline appliance is four. What we can do now for argument's sake at six, you could take it as a four and a two. So you've got extra water, extra kit, extra hose, and the usual stuff. It just gives the, the officer in charge of that is it, the, the autonomy to take it with limited personnel. That's it. Yeah. Council, Council Birch. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Liam. Uh, just one last question from me. Um, you mentioned the fire advocates and the, and the valuable role they play. In a previous life, I used to do some work with them as a community safety volunteer so i'm well aware of the work that they do in terms of community engagement obviously that would have suffered during the pandemic lack of events and being able to go out and i imagine um are things now starting to return to normal are you starting to see a level of engagement that's positive post pandemic and is there new things cropping up at these community engagement type things that you haven't seen before that have maybe come from the pandemic or just new new things yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Again, thanks, Councillor. So, it, again, things things have changed because the pandemic, in terms of um, completion rates of our safe and well visits, our referral from our partners, we're in a really good position with that. Um, we've done an awful lot of work in the last few years where an education for our crews, stressing the importance of that engagement so that our advocates and our team, safety teams have been supported by that. Um, in terms of seeing different stuff, again, I'd, I'd be leaning on Mel and her team to, to see what they're seeing at these at these meetings. Um, but in terms of delivery and the completion, I, I, that is really healthy at the moment. One of our biggest challenges at the moment in East Riding is the number of B1 completion, which is the um, it's the commercial, not the, the large scale, you'd imagine the commercial, but we're talking about flats above, takeaways and shops and that sort of thing. We've got a massive number of them in East Riding. And obviously because of the number of on-call stations we've got, we're limited to what we can do with their available time each week. So at the moment, uh, we've got a lot of resources being supported by other districts to get that those all completed by close of the financial year, which is fast approaching, as you know. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And Liam, I just want to um, confirm what you said earlier about your deliveries to the Ukraine. I'm from Gaul, so I just want to confirm so I can answer questions for my residents are you leaving on monday with the trucks yeah laden with yeah with so i'll food? just i'll just cover that off again so as we speak to so we've transitioned some brand new fire kits and rescue jackets in the last few weeks um, and that left us with a lot of kit bristol black or dark blue bristol uniform we had surplus requirements as you can probably imagine um, it's just sat there in a, in a container at the moment. So the disposal costs of that, I've got to be really careful first and foremost where we actually dispose it because we don't, one, we don't want it falling into the wrong hands, but disposal costs arguably could be quite expensive. And also there's, there's, there's some potential liability if we just pass it off and it's going to be used for firefighting purposes elsewhere. The opportunity came up obviously to donate that, which no problem at all. That was a, an easy decision to make. We've identified certain bits of kit and equipment that is also going. It all needs to be palletised and shrink wraps and everything so they can handle it because all the fire rescue services, to my mind, are doing exactly the same. We've put a request out for volunteers um, as recently as about two days ago for staff to attend today to help load the vehicle. We've got a driver training case inside the vehicle which has been loaded today with that uniform um, and some other vehicles from other, some more kit and equipment we've identified will be suitable. Um, that is all going down to um, Kent tomorrow uh, with the drivers returning on Saturday. The vehicle, double check on the facts, the vehicle that we're donating, that is going on Monday as part of a um, coordinated response and a convoy. 
Um, we've, we've put our, um, the request for two driver volunteers. Um, they're going to drive the fire appliance, which has been donated by ourselves, to Poland and delivered to the Polish fire service. Um, that's part of the convoy um, of other donated fire appliances from all the other uh, fire rescue services. And that's it on that. Okay, thank you very that's much. A, that's roughly a five-day trip. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? No. Um, can we have a briefing note on the restructure of the Humberside Fire Service? Of course, yeah. And uh, I'd like to commend your support of the, the Humberside Fire Service and Rescue Service. Sorry? Yes, that's what you do. Yeah. And I'd like, I'd like to uh, commend the support of the Fire Service for the Ukraine appeal, which is excellent. And I'd, I'd also like to... Sorry, yeah. A briefing note for the recruitment of women. Of course, Is that possible. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else on recommendations? Um, I'd just like to ask if we can uh, commend the work of the Safer Road Humber team, which is fire service, police, and council run service. Um, I was at an event on Monday morning, uh, Monday afternoon. I was speaking to the, the two uh, fire, there was fire advocate and a, a Safer Road Humber council employee, and they engage with something like 45,000 people a year which is about preventing sort of road traffic collisions, educating them on what can happen using VR and various other things like that. So I think it's just worth commending the work of, of that team, both officers in the council and um, fire officers and police officers. Excellent. That's Councillor Birch, thank you. Any other recommendations before we... Uh, Councillor Green? Yeah, I, I would like to uh, make a recommendation that we thank the Homestead Fire and Rescue Service for their... Uh, exceptionally hard work during the pandemic as well. They've delivered over 2 million pieces of PPE around the area. They've been vaccinators. They've done health calls. They were trained to drive ambulances. And I think we should recognise that as well. Thank you, Councillor Green. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to, to thank you very much for, the, for attending the meeting and uh, the excellent presentation. Thank you very much Thanks very much. Thank yep. you all. Cheers. Right, we now move on to item four of the agenda, which is the East Riding Domestic Abuse Strategy Developments and the Domestic Abuse Act of 2021, an update. We have Paul Abbott, Head of Housing, Transportation and Public Protection, which will give us uh, an update. Uh, we should have had Shelley Goodison, but unfortunately she wasn't able to attend through illness. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've not actually seen the presentation that's there up in front of you. So uh, if somebody would like to press next slide, please, I'll see what comes up and try and respond to it as best I can for you. So, um, OK, so just absorbing that. So, yeah, this is this is the sort of level of demand that's coming into the service. So as you can see there, um, we're, we're getting around 200 requests per service coming into the council's domestic violence team. And uh, there is some seasonality in that. It's not a flat figure every every month. And certainly there was a spike over Christmas. Um, the police are our main partner in terms of referrals coming in. So over 80% of the, uh, the referrals coming into the domestic abuse team come in through Humberside Police. Other partners such as uh, Adults and Children's Social Care and partners in the NHS do make some referrals, but at a much smaller level. Um, the next line there is about MARAC. So MARAC is the multi-agency risk assessment and coordination meeting. And we get together every month with our partners. So Humberside Police, um, Adults Children's Services, Humberside Fire and Rescue also attend MARAC. And we discuss the high risk cases. So uh, in those uh, discussions, we make sure that uh, where appropriate actions are given to agencies and then they're followed up. So uh, high risk cases, the, the, the safety is planned and managed in that activity. Um, it is one of our most time consuming um, and detailed partnership arrangements because 
actually um, we could handle about 30 cases a day. So if we get up to 43, then that Marek meeting expands into a second day. So there's a high level of activity and it has to be treated very seriously with, with good preparation for that meeting. So it's very time consuming to do the job properly. There's some information there about the, uh, the level of demand in different wards. And as you can see, uh, two parts of Bridlington, the central and the old town, and uh, Ghoul, Ghoul South and Bridlington South are our top three demand areas. So that's been fairly consistently so for, for many years now. The last time we did a significant review at the beginning of the strategy, uh, two or three years ago, um, those were still the highest areas and, and, and clearly that's being maintained. Uh, but there are also other areas across the East Riding that have higher than average figures and Minster and Woodmansea is one of those. And one of our key performance indicators is to respond promptly to high risk cases. So one of the questions from members was around how we actually uh, ensure we we get a uh, an acceptance of our service from uh, people who are referred to us from the victims. And there is academic research that shows that victims are most likely to engage if we get to them very close after the time of trauma and after the incident has been reported. So that 48 hour window is crucial. So that's one of our, our prime indicators. Next slide, please. Uh, right, uh, I was planning to talk about this, good. So, so these are the things that we've been doing in the last 12 months. These are the, uh, the key developments we've had in place, some under the strategy and, and other pieces of work that we've just been uh, uh, taking on a slightly more ad hoc basis. So back in uh, 31st of January, we did the members awareness briefing. So we were trying to ensure that all elected members across the East Riding are uh, understanding of our strategy, uh, know of our key developments, and most importantly, know what domestic abuse is and how members can assist us in, in dealing with these issues and referring victims through. Um, we've also had a key development of a 24-hour online chatbot. The importance of that is that our domestic abuse service is a nine to five service. It's not an emergency service and people need help at all hours of the day and they often arrive at our website. So um, improving that website and making sure there was clarity of the information and people could find the, the right level of information for them 24 hours a day is, was very important development for us. And, um, and what we have found, it is being extensively used. We have got good feedback on it. And, and the, the bottom line on that is if you're in immediate danger, dial 999 now rather than you know, waiting for the council to pick up responses later. We are working with um, representation from the community and voluntary sector. So what we're actually, because in the East Riding, our DVAP service is part of the council, there is relatively little third sector development and engagement on the subject of domestic abuse, but it is something that we're wanting to grow because we'd like communities to be able to help themselves and to be able to recognize domestic abuse and pass people into the service, but also to develop self-help groups for when, um, when people have been helped through the service. So that's a crucial um, part of our, our, our plans for this, this, uh, this current year. We've just gone out to tender uh, and we have a suitable quotation, so we'll be bringing that in in the very near future. An interesting development is our reach out to primary care. So IDVA is there as, a, as an acronym on the screen. That's the Independent Domestic Violence Advocate. That is the qualification for being a, a professionally badged domestic abuse worker. We don't have to have that, but it's a good standard to reach, and so we've trained the vast majority of our, our domestic abuse staff as being IDFAs. One of the problems that we had was that the levels of referrals from GPs was patchy. Some services, some areas identified more than others. So what we've done with this is we've got a trained domestic abuse worker who is going out to the GP surgeries. We'll be having timed surgeries within those in the high demand areas so that if somebody presents 
with domestic abuse issues, there's some, a professional there who can help them straight away. And it will also just raise awareness inside the, all those surgeries that we're working with. And that's being funded by the clinical commissioning group. So really good partnership work in there. Um, child, adolescent to parent violence is a growing concern. Children abusing their parents, it's something that is um, being increasingly recognised in the domestic abuse world. And so we've had specific training that's been provided to uh, our colleagues in both children's services and the DVAP team. Um, we're also working on a new service. So um, what we call the whole family IDVA team. So there is an adult victims worker, a perpetrators worker and a children's support worker. So whichever member of the family in, in a high risk children's services comes in, we can, we can collectively support the whole family. We are putting that team into the targeted children's services. So working closely with our partners and providing wraparound support for all members of families at times of crisis. Uh, and we've also, as um, members, you'll be aware, the, the council passed the resolution with relation to violence against women and girls so we're also picking up that agenda and making sure that we recognise the importance of uh, VORG, as we call it, or violence and women against women and girls in full uh, and working with the police and crime commissioner and with the CSP where we're uh, seeking to, for instance, coordinate things like improvements to CCTV systems and uh, give, give, give women and, and girls the confidence to be out in the community fully. Next slide, please. And the future. OK, so we're in year two of our strategy. Um, we, 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 well, sorry, we, we, we've completed year two. We're, in, we're just about to start year three. Uh, we've still got some actions that are required. One of the things we're wanting to do is improve feedback from uh, children and victims. It is an obligation at our strategic board from government requirements that the voice of the victim is heard there. So it's not just professionals talking about the services they deliver, but actually we need to know what the public's opinion of those services is. Are we meeting the needs or are we doing what we think is right and, and missing the, the boat in some way? So engagement with the voice of the victim is a key development that we're pushing forward this year. We are working with the police and crime commissioner He's just launched a new public health approach plan for domestic abuse, basing it in the Bridlington area, because Bridlington is a community which has high levels of domestic abuse. It has done for, well, for as long as I've seen statistics for, and um, so as, as a relatively isolated community, there's an opportunity there to try approaches to see if they work and to see what the impacts are in terms of outcomes for communities. And so really that's about focusing on perpetrators because it's perpetrators that commit domestic abuse. It's not the victim's fault, it's the perpetrator's entire responsibility. So how do we work with young people to prevent them from becoming perpetrators? How do we work in the community so that domestic abuse doesn't cascade down the generations? And how do we address perpetrators' behaviors to make them understand the harm that they're causing? Uh, so a key development there. And then finally, um, Shelley's major task later on this year will be a complete uh, refresh of the strategy, make sure we're still meeting the needs in terms of the things coming out from the voice of the victim and, uh, and then relaunching our strategy as we go forward. Next slide, please. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask the, the first question, Paul. Um, some, some people still are working from home. Um, does this continue to increase the number of referrals to your service? Or is it still around about average? Yeah, so yes, there are lots of people still working from home. A lot of society has started to recover and go back to uh, so their prior ways of working, but there are still people who, who are in sort of job roles that have changed. And there are still people who are nervous about coming back into society. And all those things can have impacts on household dynamic dynamics there was somewhat of an increase in demand during the pandemic and the lockdowns but actually the 
the major issue that we experienced wasn't just demand level, it was more about complexity and urgency because things had often escalated farther and faster than they would do in northern circumstances. So we were dealing with higher levels of high risk cases rather than just higher numbers across the board. So, so yes, there was an impact on that. Uh, and, and as you saw from the Marek figure with 40 odd cases a month, there is still a high level of high risk activity out there. Uh, Councillor Jeffries. Paul, what innovative ways have you changed your support both during the lockdown and as restrictions have eased? Okay, so um, one of the things that we have done is what we call focus on the front door. Um, it was quite hard with our previous ways of working to, to make sure that we um, focused our efforts on the highest priority cases. So what we have done is a focus on those high risk cases so that we're getting to those within that 48 hour window that I mentioned when in the presentation. So that's a key change. And we have very, very high levels of uh, of achieving that target now, well over 90% um, completion of those issues. One of our other issues is um, some of our services have stopped. So we stood down a lot of our group work because people didn't want to engage in groups during the, um, the lockdowns, et cetera. So we have things like freedom programs where victims come together to explore the issues around abuse and increase their understanding of uh, domestic abuse as a, as, a, as a topic and how to um, increase their resilience. That has stood down, but it's picking back up again now. Group work has recommenced. Instead of that, we did much more online work and a lot of that has been successful. We have found that rather than driving around the East Riding to victims, provided they have a smartphone, we can access them and we can do good quality one-to-one -one work online. That's all, but also been successful with some perpetrator work as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a panacea. It doesn't replace the other lines of activity because there are some people who prefer face-to-face -face involvement. So making sure that we tailor the services to the needs of the individual is crucial. When you when you mentioned that, uh, perpetrators, it was on the tip of my tongue just to say, when you lower the, the group work, or for obvious reasons, but it's mainly, group work is mainly done with perpetrators. So you're going to get a hit, aren't you? Which yeah, that. so... You're going to have to draw that back, aren't you, now? That yeah. So, so individual back, work with perpetrators has continued. Yeah. Group work with perpetrators has always been somewhat more problematic. Um, so yeah. I say uh, predominantly at the moment, it's individual work with perpetrators, uh, group work, say recomm recommencing with uh, adult victims. Because that does work better. Yeah. Well, it, it gives a different dynamic and, and it enables people to see they're not alone, if exactly. nothing else. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask a sub question as well, Chair? Thank uh, Paul, thank you for all up to now. Um, what positive developments have we received so far from your action plan? Uh, well, as, I, as I outlined, um, the, the actions that have been um, done to date uh, include uh, training for staff in key issues, particularly, as I said, around the, uh, the children as perpetrators, uh, reaching out to the NHS, so working closely with the clinical commissioning group. I gave the example of the GP outreach services, but one of the other comments from victims when we did the victim survey at the beginning of the strategy was around recovery. One of the important things is to recover from um, domestic abuse. So we are also working with the CCG on making sure that there is clear line of referral through to mental health recovery services. So uh, a focus on that um, and other elements of the strategy that have been important have been around communications, raising the issues. That's one of the reasons why we came to elected members to do that training, just to make sure that the, 
the community the communities and their representatives all see this as an important issue for the east riding that is worthy of our attention so the recovery rate for the abuser is um, a long term really isn't it it's very individual is my understanding yeah. so there are some people who um re recover very quickly from from abuse there are other people who are traumatized for a, a very long period of time and need ongoing and complex support so making sure that there is that range of offer out there to help that recovery one of the other things that we're seeking to do is actually in the next year is as part of our community outreach is put self-help groups in so that victims in a certain locality can again realize they're not alone because one of the things that we have is a reluctance from our professional staff to let people go at the end of the programs because currently there's not a lot out there to let them go to so if we can get these community self-help groups established and we're, we're just about to recruit yeah. a, a member of staff to help with that then that will give us that something to refer on to which will help us to let people go and help them to embrace those new services. So they're not just dropped. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the other one was I was going to ask you about on your development side, child adolescence, parents, violence and abuse, training being given. Do you find that today's children are very streetwise, the fact that you can't touch me, you can't hit me, uh, and this is a problem with a parent, can't, shall we say, I'll use the word chastise, because they're frightened that they will end up in trouble themselves. Do you think that is a, a, a leading into? I'm afraid that's beyond my level of professional expertise <laughs> to answer in particular. But what I would say to you is that um, this is an area which is coming to the fore. And one of the things possibly is um, embarrassment from the parents about the fact that they that they are not in control in their own households. So I think there's a, a variety of reasons why it's it's either growing or being reported more, but I think both of those could play an element, but I'm afraid I can't answer your specific sense. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> well, just let's hope I can get these words up. Um, yes, well, what alternative accommodation is offered for these victims? Who pays? How long is it for? can they ever return home is it a lifetime tenancy okay right so, sorry about that okay um so <laughs> i think the first thing that i would say is our aim is not to move the victim if the victim can be self safely maintained <laughs> in the property that they are already in where they have the support and care of their family and their community and their friends, why would you move the victim? The first thing to do is get the perpetrator out. So a focus on removing the perpetrator and our colleagues in Humberside Police taking effective action with orders if in court, et cetera, um, to get the perpetrators out from the property has to be our, our first strand of attack. The second thing I would say as part of that, we uh we do safety planning with the victims so if for instance they need chains alarms on doors um security measures to help them be safe and feel safe in their own home we facilitate those works so get the perpetrator out make the victim feel safe comes first there are times however when people either have to flee or want to flee sometimes within the east riding and sometimes from outside coming in and inside going out we don't have a refuge a, a large building full of um you know victims of domestic abuse and their families because it would stick out like a sore thumb in the east riding and it would also mean that people had to travel to a particular place so we have a dispersed refuge system we have i think it's 11 properties at the moment scattered across the east riding in different towns and villages and um they are furnished units and they facilitate somebody fleeing and going there often with very little in the way of possessions and and comforts but we provide a a good quality furnished um space 
I believe we showed you pictures of that on the members training. So I think you've seen pictures of those units. Um, so that's what we do, where we do it and the numbers. You asked who pays. Uh, for many of these people, flaying abuse, uh, housing benefit, and 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 uh, universal universal credit etc is uh, is sought. So we don't just move the person; we seek them to engage with the benefit system etc to okay. give them that wraparound support so that they can um, um, flourish in those uh, bits of accommodation. The furnished units are not a permanent offer. That's somewhere where we take people to give them safety whilst we work out what the long-term best solution is. Mm -hmm. If that long-term best solution is council accommodation, then they get quite a high level of points on the, um, uh, the, the application systems for their uh, domestic abuse status. And then finally, Yes, there is an obligation on the council under the new Domestic Abuse Act to provide lifetime accommodation if that's what they seek. And so that's the kind of tenancy we would facilitate for them. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm sorry about all the questions in one. But I think uh, I covered it. Councillor <laughs> <laughs> uh, Norman. Uh, thank you, Paul. Yes, uh, I think you did cover everything that... Uh, um, Councillor Green was just mentioned, but there is one other area, of course, which we've kind of not touched on entirely, which is if the, uh, the victim does have to flee, generally they will be fleeing with the children as well, if there are any, and of course, potentially going to a different school. What sort of mental health services and support is there, there Paul, for obviously that the, the child might be traumatised because of what's been going on in the home and is there any opportunity for them to stay at the same school? So yes clearly the focus um, on the children is an important part. Children's are, children are victims of domestic abuse in their own right if they've seen abuse in their household. We have a support package. We work with our colleagues in children's services to make sure that the needs of the families are broadly met. We also have a children's service within the DVAP team, which specifically provides a, a response and a recovery and an understanding of the issues around domestic abuse. And when children are forced to move um, wherever possible, you're absolutely right. Maintaining them in their existing school with their existing friend and you know peer group network is crucially important. And under the transportation side of my portfolio, if somebody is forced to flee, we do put in place home to school transport to facilitate um, where, wherever we can do uh, people um, maintaining attendance at their normal school whilst they are in a temporary urgent accommodation elsewhere. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Scow. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, morning, Paul. Well done. <laughs> I mean, dropped in at the, at the last minute. You're doing a great job there. But who, who would expect anything else? Um, yeah, uh, perpetrators. We've mentioned them once or twice this morning. Um, how do we encourage them to change the ways, uh, Paul? Have we any evidence of positive outcomes? Do we get them to, to be better people in life? Have we any uh, evidence of that? Any, any measures of that? OK, so, yeah, perpetrators are the root cause of these issues and need to be a focus of our activity. We break them down into various categories. There are those who are willing to change and seeking support to change. And that's the, the, the cohort that DVAP support. Our, change, our perpetrator programs are for those who are seeking help for their behaviours. Um, and yes, we do evaluate the, uh, the outcome of that and we get extremely good feedback on our perpetrator programs within DVAP. Part of that is around domestic abuse. Part of that is wider. 
So there is a Caring Dads program, which is actually about not just around abuse issues, but about interactions with children and the wider being a father responsibilities. We also deliver that. Um, we need to be careful and selective in terms of the people that we put through those programs, however, because disguised cooperation, um, being seen to be compliant when not necessarily being truly compliant are all issues that my professionals in the service are very used to dealing with and they can recognize those issues to make sure that safety is maintained at all times. The other thing that is particularly um, pertinent to perpetrators at the moment is work with uh, Humberside Police in the MATAC. I can remember the acronym, I cannot remember the component parts, I'm afraid, but MATAC is the, the perpetrator management partnership. And um, in that meeting, serial perpetrators, repeat perpetrators with high harm behaviours get addressed. And again, actions get tasked out. Um, to make sure that A, the victims of those perpetrators are supported. That might be daily door knocks from Humberside Police. It might be other people calling around on a frequent basis so that the agencies are there in case of trouble or need. And the other part of it is disrupting the behaviour of the perpetrator and making sure that they know that their behaviours are unacceptable and are, are being um, challenged by the system. So... Um, both ends of the spectrum there, the most serious ones and the most likely to seek help and change are yeah. both separately identified and, and, and dealt with. Okay, thank you, Paul. So second point, if I could, Chair, um, I can't see it down as a question, and it's the, the one of your favourite uh, topics, Paul, at the early intervention uh, scheme, which uh, was originally taken by the police, as you know, with Sergeant Ryan doing a fantastic job in Bridlington South, as probably Councillor Norman will know about. Uh, the domestic abuse figures did reduce with that scheme. The, the police abandoned it because of funding, I believe. We've taken it on board, you've taken it on board, Paul. Um, how's that progressing now? Um, okay, so the early intervention program was always a time limited program. It was one that we sought to maintain and cascade across the East Riding, but as you said, Councillor Scow, we were unsuccessful in, in making that argument. Not yeah. all elements of it ceased, however. Um, so some elements of the early intervention project were carried forward. Part of that was the fact that the officers who had been on that project were trained in intervening effectively in households and also um, had the wider partnership knowledge from, from colleagues that, that, uh, that they'd worked with. So those elements of, the, of the, the scheme in Bridlington continued. The relationship between police and other colleagues has remained strong. The second thing I would say is that, for instance, the, the neighbourhood policing teams attending MARAC, the victims meeting, has continued. So we can task the neighbourhood policing team with going and knocking on the door and being that presence, which um, indicates that somebody cares and, and is there to, to be supportive if they're wanted. So that has been maintained. And then the final thing is, uh, as you said, Councillor Scow, we are we are at the early stages of replacing the police led early intervention programme with a housing led programme. Uh, we have a new uh, a new programme manager who is uh, who, who's accepted responsibility for that particular area of task. It's it's slowly building councillor scout and hopefully we'll come back to the committee at some point later in the year and, and with some positive reports on how far we've got but we've got uh, keenness from agencies to engage and we now have our our staffing and capacity lined up to help deliver that and get that get that flying again yeah thanks paul possibly we can have a brief note later in the year as to the progress i, I believe acceptable? i'm already obliged to provide you with one councillor okay <laughs> thank you Paul, do you ever 
have any offers of voluntary help from the community? Or is it something that is probably um, not sort of sought after? Our, How difficult would that be to fit into the programme? Because really what you're saying is it's all very much um, someone that knows what they're doing instead of asking for help. So I think that question was rather relevant. So yeah. I think yeah. it's not a good question. Well, no, no, there is relevance to it. Um, so in terms of helping a high risk victim at the time of crisis, I think professional services are the right methodology for mm. doing that and maintaining safety because that is is paramount when when dealing with domestic abuse cases i think however there is need for community understanding of abuse so that it's recognized when it occurs and referral is made at the earliest possible moment Good. so i think that's a strand where community knowledge understanding and and knowledge of the referral pathways is crucial and secondly, in terms of those self-help groups, making sure that we establish those networks so we have someone to refer people on to. That's our major target for development that, we're, that we're wanting to get those supportive um, um, systems up and running this year. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, you you'll, I'm sure you'll love this question, Paul. Um, funding. Uh, obviously, a lot of these things rely on correct amount of funding, and I think it's safe to say there's probably never enough funding for, especially for things like this, that we, we could always want more to be able to do more. Um, obviously, this new domestic abuse strategy has highlighted some changes that are needed and some priorities. Is 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 the funding enough, either from our own funds and from central government, and and is it been allocated and spent effectively enough to deliver the priorities of the new strategy? So first of all, the allocation of funding. Um, the council has always provided services for our in-house domestic abuse for, uh, funding. The level has gone up and down over time as various grants have come and gone, but we have never cut our core funding for maintaining a, a service for victims and children. So I'm pleased to say that throughout all of our, our previous decade or so of financial austerity, we have recognised the, the importance of abuse. And that's given us the baseline on which to build. The second thing I would say is the government has actually provided us with significant funding. We've had over half a million pounds um, last financial year. Same again this year with a minor uplift, not quite inflationary, but Nevertheless, I would say very, um, very good funding uh, has been confirmed again for next financial year. Now, clearly, if we're producing long term sustainable services, we need that to be maintained in the future. So there's no point in bringing in a service and then finding out after two years, actually, we can't we can't. Um, facilitate it any longer and we have to drop it so i would say to you that so far it's a good news story i have sufficient resources to uh enable me to deliver the strategy i believe to a good standard and then are we spending it the right way uh we are seeking to develop a performance framework which includes outcomes so that we can see for instance, with the children's service, do the children believe they get a good service that assists their recovery? If the answer is yes, we keep going with it. If the answer is no, something is failing to meet their needs, then we need to challenge and change it. So um, I believe funding is, I say, currently uh, comfortably sufficient. And as to the outcomes that we're achieving, we are seeking to develop thorough evaluation methodologies to to ensure we focus the funding where it does the most good thank you can i ask a supplementary but sorry um obviously you've developed the strategy and it's a long-term strategy and this will always be a long-term thing government funding uh, wait until the year 
and get it or do you get a forward plan or rough idea of what you're going to get because obviously you can't plan a strategy without knowing that the funding is going to be there and it would be um remiss of the government to remove funding for domestic abuse i don't think they'd get any good good rep for that but as you say you've got more funding this year but it's not in rate with inflation etc and the priorities from central government on domestic abuse is 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 there somewhere that you know how much funding you're going to get or is there somewhere that or you get an idea and second part um, if you can remember this, is obviously looking at outcome-based approach is the best way forward for something like this to make sure it's been delivered correctly. Is during that outcome-based approach sort of consultation with victims and also perpetrators to make sure that the service that we've delivered has helped them and deliver? Obviously, we can see it's helped them from their change in lifestyle, but then, for want of a better word, a questionnaire survey of them to see how they found the service once we've sort of released them and we've passed them on to, say, a voluntary group or they're back into the community. Yeah. OK, so the government has confirmed new burdens funding will be maintained for domestic abuse. I do not have a figure, though, past next financial year. However, the, the principle of commitment has been given. So that's as best as I can <laughs> answer that first element. And as to the second element, yes, we do survey our victims, our children, our perpetrators, etc. cetera. Um, we also seek where we can do to use um, academically accredited uh, programmes that, that have been demonstrated elsewhere to meet certain standards in terms of changes to behaviour. And then clearly the evaluation is, are we delivering it correctly in our locality? Uh, and the voice of the victim, um, which I've said we're, we're bringing in as, as a particular focus in this next 12 months, making sure that we are doing those questionnaires, we are asking them not just what they think of the council services, but what they think of all the services. Where are the gaps? What should we develop? has the way that we've done our work over the last two years of the planned activity met our targets or are there still issues that's the that's the purpose of the strategy refresh building in the voice of the victim thank you chair uh, paul how does the team respond to domestic violence that is coercive or psychological as opposed to physical Coercive control um, is a hot topic. Um, I think if it's been on the archers, then um, you know there's there's a fair wide understanding in society of it as being an issue. Uh, and our colleagues, our professionals in the services, are expert in recognizing it. We've given them specific training in coercive coercion and control. There id for training that uh, that advocate role gives them specific training in in mental health coercion control issues and we have also provided training by our in-house professionals to the wider um, professional groups so colleagues in the police uh, adult and children social care etc have had training provided by our advers so that to help them recognize it in the wider network of, of professional officers so the, the, the training has been different in the sense that it's come from a wider range of uh, professionals. Well, it, initially it was to our IDVA professionals and then it's been cascaded out to the wider social support services. Yes. OK, thank you. That has answered both mine. Thank you, Chair. Um, on to a slightly different topic to my previous question, but one that I'm keen on. Um, in terms of obviously the new domestic abuse act it mentions and specifically relates to members of the lgbt community and specifically transgender community on page 20 paragraph 4.61 and 4.62 it talks about the under as part of the domestic abuse act the development of victim and survivor peer support groups across communities within the each riding with a lead officer post being considered by the local authority to support the implementation of this this will ensure the hard to reach groups such as uh, transgender members of the community are, are, are helped in the best way possible. Has 
is it says is is being con uh, being commissioned by the uh, local authority. Is that uh, how far down the road are we with that? And when when do we expect that officer to be in first? And what what is their first is their first priority setting up these peer groups? And will this be a um, obviously it be council led in the first instance? But will this be a sort of a community voluntary group, or will it be? Um, and then will it be continue to be supported by the council, or will it be sort of handed off once it's got going to be a, a self sort of contained community? So one of our developments under the strategy is making sure that we meet the need of diverse client groups. If, if you close your eyes and imagine a domestic abuse victim, then typically it would be a, a woman and, and suffering at the hands of a man. It's not always like that. Our officers recognize that. We are producing specific um, policies, strategies, outcomes to, to deal with the diversity of different groups that can come through, be that gender, sexual orientation, uh, e even religion or um, ethnic background can alter one's experience of domestic abuse. So ensuring our needs, our services meet the needs of diversity is one of our planned developments. This officer, how far have we got with it? The post has been evaluated. We, we're at the decision record stage. So Paul and I will be signing off the, the, the putting of that person into our structure. We're at that point now. We then need to clearly go out to recruitment. The purpose of that role is to establish these groups. Again, diversity built into the, those, those groups. And to maintain those groups. There's no point in setting up groups and then wandering away and, and, and having them quietly collapse behind you. It's, it's giving the groups the capacity to launch and then whatever level of support they need in order to maintain that. And clearly, some of the groups will be locality-based. Some of the groups will be possibly more specialised depending on um, the needs of the individuals concerned. But all that will be... Um, taken and maintained no, just ask one. um just on so on on that topic specifically do we have um i like to see numbers on on paper do we have statistics of what sort of service users we have access in the domestic abuse teams from for want of a better word the edi background of of their protected characteristics is that something we record yeah we have some of that information okay. So one of the developments that's not been flagged so far is about our information handling. Um, you may be aware as elected members that adults and children's services are moving onto the ASEAS computer system. It's a big development. It's a big project. Um, my domestic abuse services currently have a small database which enables them to gather some information. We do, for instance, I, I know we have some ethnicity and sexual orientation information. Um, so we, we have a, a small level of data. But the new ASEAS system, we are the first development of phase two is getting domestic abuse services onto the same system as adults and children's services so we can effectively see and share information with those partners much more quickly and easily and um full of qualities information is built into the uh, into that system and that'll be one of the benefits from mm -hmm. from that move across okay would, um just would it be possible to get some sort of breakdown of what data you do have on the people accessing the service, both victims and perpetrators, just... I will specifically request that information is provided for you, Councillor Thank Birch. you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to poll, uh, how does the team engage with victims who do not want your support? I know over the years we've, we've read in papers uh, when I previously served on this committee, you know, we heard of the uh, drunken man who beat his wife one night and then uh, next morning, uh, you, you know, she changes her story, she doesn't want anything to happen and this sort of thing. I mean, how do you cope with these sort of things? Um, it, 
it remains an issue, Councillor Rudd. The, the services um, provide information on, on the topic of domestic abuse that says, for instance, many people experience up to 30 incidents before they finally snap and make a, a complaint or a referral to the authorities and support agencies. So people don't engage at, at the first incident or very, very, very rarely. And some people, if a referral is made by a, a third party, deny that it's, it's happening. And so that's certainly true. And finally, our, um, our services report a problem of people engaging, but then the perpetrator comes back, appears report remorseful, and actually they disengage with us at some point in the process as well. So all those are acknowledged issues. The main thing we can do is to try to meet the, as I explained, there is a crucial window at the time of the incident and getting the offer of support there in that first 48 hours for those high risk victims is the main thing we can do to be there at the time of crisis to say, if you want help, it's here, but it's a voluntary service and we can't force people to engage with it. And we're constantly trying new opportunities to reach out and to improve our service within that window. So <laughs> Councillor Scow mentioned Ryan Reed, um, uh, one of our, our favourite police officers, uh, early intervention, etc. And he currently is proposing a trial where we have one of our advers, our advocates, in the police response car. So the next day when the police attend, one of our people will be with them and we're, we're trying this within the next sort of couple of months just to see if we get a better engagement rate. And if it works, we'll seek to build on it and maintain it. So far, so good. <laughs> To respond to within the statute you set up, how are values against women and children and girls responding? We, we need to be clear that domestic abuse and violence against women and girls are not the same issue. And there's a clear overlap. And within the East Riding, the largest proportion of violence against women and girls is domestic abuse but it is not the sole issue. So, um, so whilst we are reflecting it in our strategy, the main thing I would say is that um, we're seeking to work with partners, Humberside Police, Police and Crime Commissioner, to raise the issue of violence against women and girls, to make sure that um, misogyny is challenged and that it is not accepted normal behaviour in our society that one should denigrate or um, abuse uh, uh, women in society. And part of that is us looking at ourselves. So the council has a, an equalities and diversity group uh, of officers. And rather than people like me and Paul, middle-aged men deciding what we should do against violence against women and girls, because clearly mansplaining is a, a big thing, um, we've turned to that equalities forum and said, how do you think we should do it? So we're awaiting feedback on that, but we want to make sure that the people who, who live the experience help us to shape how we respond to it. So if that's answered the question. Yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I have. I've actually got three, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, great job with the presentation. Um, <laughs> you got that about a minute before you started. Um, the first one, if you can just circle back to Councillor Greenwood's question uh, about the voluntary and community sectors. Um, we know that there are organisations maybe more focused towards Hull and Hull City Centre, but the likes of Hull Women's Aid, Refuge, I think, are a national charity. Um, there's the Women's Centres in Hull. Um, do we communicate with them and work with them specifically? those organisations that are set up to, to support? So, yes, all of our domestic abuse workers are very aware of those charities that are in Hull. 
Hull charities are very aware of our domestic abuse service. Just because a resident may live in, let's say, Hessel or Cottingham, it doesn't mean they won't seek help down the road in Hull. So, so we need clear referral mechanisms backwards and forwards. Some of the, uh, the services, um, there is a sexual violence advocacy service, which is commissioned by the police and crime commissioner across the whole of the Humber, which is provided by Blue Door, which is a charity based in Hull. So, so some of those services actually outreach into the East Riding. Some are only provided in Hull, but clear say knowledge and and joint working is crucial and my colleagues sit down virtually weekly with either the strategy or the delivery services in Hull um, learning from each other sharing best practice and in the next few weeks there is a humble wide launch of the domestic abuse strategies for us it's not a launch because we're already a couple of years in but it's the launches of the new strategies elsewhere we are collaborating with our colleagues across the Humber. I know Councillor Harold's been been invited to, um, to to that launch. So so yeah, close joint working is crucial. Thank you. Um, next question. It's not a very nice thing to think about. Um, I don't. I feel kind of uncomfortable asking the question actually, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that's false accusations. Um, people making accusations about domestic violence. That aren't true how do we separate that and is there any support given to somebody who has had an accusation made about them that has then turned out to be false you are slightly beyond my area of expertise with that one counts the weeks i am aware however when i I sit down with my colleagues in DVAP team. I go to their team briefings occasionally and I talk to them about what they see, what they do, and what their experiences are and, and what I can do to help. And one of the things that I know has been a previous topic of discussion actually is perpetrators claiming to be victims. So I would simply say to you, I am aware this is a complex area and... Um, and our colleagues are professionals who are used to dealing with that complexity. I couldn't really take the answer any further than that, though. That's fine. Thank you. Um, final one, um, sort of the other end of the spectrum, then, uh, when things are pretty horrible and you've got a, a case that is really quite upsetting, um, the, you know, there might be children involved, um, some of our staff are maybe parents themselves. How do they or what support is given to them for dealing with the aftermath of some of those horrible cases, the, what sort of mental support is available right. to them? So um, vicarious trauma is what the professionals uh, call the effect of the victim's experience being passed on to the professionals who are helping them. It is a recognised thing. I believe it has become worse over lockdown. Uh, because our teams who normally sit and talk together and discuss have been isolated. So, um, again, we need to acknowledge the fact that isolated staff have had a, a strong impact. One of the things that says that stuck with me, again, in those conversations I tell you I have with these colleagues, one of them said to me that during the first lockdown, it didn't feel like they were working at home. It felt like they were living at work and they couldn't separate their home life from their professional existence so i listen to these stories and we, we try and assist um so i would say we have staff who have been significantly affected we do have staff who go off with stress um we have mechanisms in place to support that in addition to all the wide council mental health services that all officers are provided with we have uh, a strong team spirit within the team they are coming back together they are meeting in person to share that burden uh within with their colleagues secondly there is a formal um supervision process in place so they can describe their current position their current caseload uh with their line manager and then finally we have commissioned some clinical supervision so where we have 
A, for all of the team, we provided them with a level of clinical supervision to, to assist them with that. But where we've had two or three members of staff who've required more, I have commissioned specific services that have engaged with them as individuals to provide them with recovery support. Thank you. Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it, it's just really a follow-up from the, from the item you mentioned earlier, Paul, with regards to the, the joint working with the, with the police service. And I'm just wondering where, uh, which part of our East Riding it would be that the, the DVAP officer would be going out with the, uh, the response officer to try and obviously in, increase the, the, uh, the response from the perpetrators, etc., because we all know within the early intervention that it was an absolutely fantastic opportunity to get to get all these teams working together. The answer to that is I'm not actually aware of whether it's a geographical basis they'll be operating in or whether they'll target it, for instance, to a certain type of client group. I don't know. I just know that we are proposing a pilot and I know that I've said, yeah, please do it with my blessing and my support and please also be as accurate as you can be in recording the outcomes and what we achieve from that so that we can thoroughly evaluate it. That's my love of knowledge, but I, as part of a future report, we will brief on, on what's been achieved through that uh, pilot process. Fantastic, thanks Paul, I look forward to that. Any other questions? Can I hear you, David? We can't hear you on Zoom, David. So, uh, the recommendation is that the subcommittee receive an update on the work on domestic abuse undertaken with the voluntary and community sectors in the East Riding. And that the domestic abuse and safeguarding partnership be commended for the excellent work they are undertaking and continue to undertake. And the breakdown of what data is held on service users from LGBTQ communities. We could have that as well. And thank you for a very good presentation. Yeah. Right, we move on now to Tenant's Champion Service Update, which is item five on the agenda. Um, once again, Paul, you're in the seat. I am. Uh, Jeff Mann couldn't make it. But at least I wrote this presentation, Chair. Sure, you did. <laughs> That's over to you. Right, next slide, please. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, we had a, uh, a request from members fasting, following the... Um, the resolution at council that you receive an update on the potential development of a tenant's champion services, uh, particularly asking about council responsibilities, the remit of those services, costs and benefits. So that was the question. Next slide, please. I thought my slide presser had gone. I was, I was feeling abandoned. Um, so the, the first question there was the council's responsibilities. So we have a responsibility as a local authority. As we explored in detail at our last meeting, to provide a tenants engagement function. The housing white paper is redefining those duties and is um, giving us sort of more detailed responsibilities. But I say we explored that in detail last time. We also provide advice services to private sector tenants uh, regarding housing conditions, the obligations of landlord, safety issues like gas and electric checks and things like um, illegal evictions and tenant harassment, et cetera. My colleagues in the private sector housing team provide that service to, uh, to, to, uh, to tenants of private landlords. And other services also provide advice and guidance to, to tenants across the East Riding, particularly things like the welfare visiting team, for instance, giving uh, financial and, and benefits advice. Uh, so my colleague in Jill Barley's area, um, to deal with that particular uh, line of uh, support as well. Next slide, please. 
So the Tenants Champion Service was suggested and we did some research and we found Tenants Champion Services, particularly in two London boroughs. That seemed to be where the idea had originated. And I would simply say they are very different beasts from the East Riding. So the London Borough of Richmond has no council-owned stock. All of its stock is managed by housing associations. And therefore, whereas we have this in-house tenants engagement function, as previously discussed, they don't have that because they have no direct relationship with the tenants. So instead, they have a tenant champion service, which effectively recreates our engagement and participation functions and also gives a feedback system. And they also have a counsellor who is a tenant champion. So that's how they do it there. But they're not starting from the same starting point of in-house stock as we do. The second thing is that there is Wandsworth, again, a, uh, a London borough. They have a different definition of, um, of tenant champion. Again, they don't directly manage their own stock. So they don't have that engagement function that we have. They have now ALMOs, are arm's length management organisations their housing stock has been passed out to third parties and their tenant champions are community champions and it is part of their tenant uh, and resident participation structure so again they're delivering what we regard as our tenant engagement function through that mechanism next slide please so effectively, from my perspective, our tenant engagement service provides a comparable service to the, the bulk of that tenant champion activity. The other thing that we have is our council feedback service, because let's face it, no service is perfect. And if we get something wrong, our tenants need a mechanism through which to explore A, how to get it put right, and B, to get an apology, et cetera, if that's appropriate and required. So um, we try and maintain a high quality service. The scale of our business is frankly enormous. We have 11,000 council homes approximately, approximately 1,000 of those turnover every year, 1,000 new lets. We carry out 40,000 reactive repairs and and let, let's hold our hands up here and say, whilst we aim for a high quality service, you are going to hit bumps down the road with that scale of business. So we get we do get tens of complaints a month. Um, a few of those aren't resolved at first point of contact. Most of them are. It's things like missed appointments. It's things like work that people feel hasn't been done to the highest quality standard. Sometimes it's things like um, people expressing dissatisfaction with where they are on the waiting list. Um, but only a few, just tens per year, get escalated to director level if it hasn't been effectively resolved at the first point of contact. And then finally, there is a housing ombudsman and there are other tenants uh, participation functions which uh, also uh, uh, facilitate complaints about our services only a handful of complaints go to the housing ombudsman per year. And for the vast majority of those around two thirds, we're not found to have done anything wrong. Our service has been provided correctly to a high standard. It just didn't quite meet the expectations that they were there. So clearly sometimes communication could, 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 could help us with these things. So my, my bottom line is that I believe that the, um, the Tenants Champion Service effectively replicates much of what we already have and provide. I don't think it would particularly add anything to our provision. And on that basis, um, I would not suggest that we should um, actively work up that as a proposal. Thank you. Uh, questions now, uh, Councillor Scow? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for that, Paul. I know there's an awful, an awful lot of work gone into 
um, to try and better ways of, of, of communicating with our tenants. And uh, and I think Mavis is there this morning. Good morning to you, Mavis. I'm sure you're listening. Yeah, very yes, close. good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm sure yeah. you're listening to, uh, very closely to what's being said. There's an awful lot of work going on um, behind the scenes to try and make it better for us to take up our, our tenants' complaints, etc. Uh, there is a consultation being going on. I was going to ask you, Paul, when, when do you think that will be in place? When will this, this be reported? And, and can we have a briefing note or possibly um, at our next meeting, housing, housing meeting? So how is, how is it going at the moment? I know there's three levels to it, if I remember, and um, it's quite complex. So thank you, Councillor Scout. So yes, work is in progress on the, um, the development of our engagement service. Whilst our colleague from the fire brigade was, was presenting to you, I was actually reading our draft of the next tenant's newsletter and making some suggestions as to how to get that out. So engagement with our tenants, sharing our proposals with the wide uh, network of tenants and seeking their feedback on it to make sure that we know that they are supportive of the proposals that we have is crucial because if we don't meet the needs of our tenants, then then what's the point, quite frankly? Um, so we are going out to that consultation um, with, with our next um, newsletter to the tenants. We will be seeking their responses um, during the month of April. We are trying to hit a schedule of bringing back um, our final proposals and taking them to cabinet around July time, we anticipate, but clearly Councillor Scow will very happily share the results of the, um, the tenants' feedback on our proposals and how that's changed our proposals, because it should change our proposals uh, in, in at least some detail, uh, and we will bring back tenants' uh, feedback as a briefing note to this committee. Okay, Paul, thank you. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, how can the tenants now apply to be part of that new residential uh, involvement structure? Well, I've been to a couple of these meetings before lockdown. Uh, some were very good, some were a little bit iffy. So are they going to be back on, on board and will I get meet Mavis again? I hope that Mavis will always be here and as soon as we uh, she can get back in purpose... It's I, I am room. here. <laughs> <laughs> I am here. I'm trying to listen now. Uh, what about this survey? When does it finish, Paul? Uh, well, I'll just answer um, uh, the, the first question first from Councillor okay, Padman, yeah, and then I'll come back to you, maybe. So, okay, um, tenants will be asked how they want to participate, and some will want to participate in detail through those formal structures. Others will only want to participate occasionally and maybe electronically. So. The first principle is trying to give as many ranges and options for consultation as, as tenants would seek. The second thing would be um, for those formal structures, we will seek to ensure that uh, we attract tenants who are diverse so that we're attracting as many tenants from as many different groups as possible. And secondly, we will try and set out specifications so that the, we have a, a high calibre of candidate who is uh, coming forward to fill those. And those processes will be um, ongoing um, throughout uh, the, the, the next sort of 12 months in terms of recruitment to those. Uh, Mavis, in terms of the... The, the feedback, um, I say we've we've got the draft newsletter now. We will be going out to tenants uh, hopefully early April, and we should be analysing the response from that feedback towards the end of April into early May is the indicative timeline. OK, thank you. I'm pleased to hear that they're looking for, um, you know, more tenants, more, more diverse and with... Uh, lots of experience behind them because I, I think there is uh, a lot of experience that you're not tapping into. Have we lost the sound again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
In again, sorry. Yeah, um, recommendations. I have done. Yeah, but nobody else has. Okay, so Paul, just because you, I was on, thank you very much. <laughs> they didn't see you on the on the line. <laughs> Okay, we now move on to uh, item number six, which is covert surveillance under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, uh, which is uh, REPA and uh, the Investigatory Powers Act, IPA. And I'd like to welcome Nick King, who's a solicitor, who's going to give us some information on the matter. Uh, yes, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can't hear him, uh, Chair. Is that working now? Yeah, we're we'll getting it now. Yeah. Oh, I can start properly then. Good afternoon. I want to say good morning first. Uh, well, could, could I just, just one second. Uh, is, is, is there anyone requiring a break? You would like to go for a break? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yep. Okay, if you're happy with that, I'll give a break. No, I'm fine. I've got.
Right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, right, if uh, you'd like to commence. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, for allowing me to come today to present uh, the report. Uh, the purpose of the report this year is twofold. Um, firstly, it's to update the committee on the use of covert surveillance techniques by the authority uh, that fall under the regulation of Investigative Powers Act, RIPA, and the Investigative Powers Act, IPA, uh, regime since October 2020. Uh, and secondly, it's to update the committee on the recent inspection undertaken by the Office of uh, the Investigative Powers Commissioner's Office. Um, committee is also respectfully asked to consider both of, uh, of those uh, within the report. Um, looking at the report itself, uh, paragraphs two, three, and four, um, there is a brief explanation of what we mean by covert surveillance techniques um, in the remit of RIPA and IPA. Um, these will generally arise in criminal investigations undertaken by uh, the authority and, and they fall into three different categories. Um, the first category is the carrying out of uh, directed surveillance, and that's the use of covert CCTV cameras um, to record individuals in public uh, and where the person being recorded does not know they're being recorded by the authority. Um, the second uh, is the use of a covert human intelligence source, which uh, abbreviated to a CHIS. Um, this is where an individual who is tasked to establish a personal relationship with another person and that other person doesn't know they've been tasked by the authority uh, for that relationship. And that's purely so that that person can then obtain information about that person and pass that to the council, council officers who are carrying out the investigation. Um, the third is the acquisition of communications data. And by this, we generally mean um, the who, whose mobile phone this person is. So the officers will have a mobile phone number and they wish to know whose mobile phone number that is. Um, well, there is a, a, an ability for the authority to find out the name, contact details of that person whose mobile phone number is. That's the, set, the third aspect of communications data. Those are set out in more detail in paragraph two, three and four in the report. Um, I think it's worth remembering that neither RIPA or IPA uh, enable the actual techniques to take place. Uh, they don't empower us to carry out the, the covert surveillance, but what they do do is provide the regulatory framework um, through which the authority can satisfy itself and anybody else that the activity is lawful. It's a lawful acquisition. It's a lawful um, um, covert surveillance. Um, the report also sets out uh, in paragraph five, the application process by which the authority or through which the authority has to uh, authorise the activity. Um, as I said, this is in paragraph five, and essentially for the first two, te two techniques, which is the use of a, a CHIS and directed surveillance. This involves an applicant who, for our purposes, will be an investigating officer from the council, from the authority, um, completing an application form, and this then being passed to one of the council's authorising officers. The names of those officers are set out in the policy. They're senior officers who are trained in, in this process um, and, and that officer will assess the application and only if they're satisfied that it's necessary and proportionate will the activity be authorised and thereafter an application is made to the magistrate's court for judicial approval. Um, the third and final technique I talked about communications data so that's the telephone number um, that involves an application via the National Anti-Fraud Network abbreviated to NAFN uh, and that's to the Office of Communications Data Authorisations. And again, it's an applicant, it's an investigating officer will fill in the application and via NAFN it'll be sent to OCDA uh, and only if it's authorised, again, will the activity take place, will the person's details be provided. Um, with regard to three techniques, the report does set out in paragraph seven that the authorities made no applications for authorisation uh, since October. Um, and the second part of the report, and this is maybe a little bit more pertinent, is that Periodically, the authority is inspected uh, by the Investigative Powers Commissioner's Office. And we had an inspection in December of last year. Um, there should be in the papers uh, a copy of the inspection report that the inspector prepared and was sent in uh, to the authority. Um, I think it's pleasing to note uh, from our part, the inspector found that we were in a good place uh, with regards to RIPA. Uh, and from a personal point, the inspector recognised the comprehensive training programme that's undertaken by the council by officers, uh, for investigating officers, and also the uh, high standard of oversight and authority with, with regard to the RIPA and IPA process. Um, there were some minor amendments recommended by the inspector, 
uh, to the policy and, and uh, the amended policy is an appendices to the report, that's the appendix B. Um, overall, as I said, the inspector found the authority was in a good place again, uh, and I think that's something that we shall be proud of. Um, and that's the, 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 uh, the, the report, if there's any questions anybody may wish to ask. Uh, Councillor Dewhurst. Mm. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just sort of uh, going on from Appendix 3, and thank you for your, your report there. Um, in terms of that flowchart, I'd just like to explore what might happen if an officer perhaps uh, operated uh, or undertook an operation um, without the correct authority and what process then the council has in place to deal with that. that I appreciate I mean, that may not have happened, but what would it if, in, theory, in theory? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question. Um, as part of the comprehensive training programme that, that was highlighted by uh, the inspector, it's myself that carries out that training programme. Uh, and it's really to, I suppose if I can use the phrase, to drum in to officers, These are, this is the process, this is what we need to do. And if it, there will be situations that come to light where maybe something has happened unto or maybe something has happened that they weren't expecting. Um, and again, it, it's myself, so I'm, I'm the RIPA coordinating officer for the council. And in those circumstances, generally, everyone should know who I am and they'll highlight it to me. Uh, and there will be a sort of mini investigation and mini discussion. Uh, and I'll raise that again with Matthew Buckley, who's the head of legal. Uh, and between us, we'll, we'll investigate, work out what's happened, work out if there has been a breach. And if there has been a breach, then what do we need to actually do in order to remedy, firstly, and then secondly, make sure that it never happens again. And they, these were, um, interestingly, that's something that the inspector picked up on when the inspector came in December and asked and I suppose drilled down with Matthew what that process is in place and they were happy again with the oversight the general oversight that Matthew provides again through myself the work that we do to ensure that as best as we can things like that don't happen but where they do happen work out why they've happened and then ensure that it doesn't happen again. Councillor Birch. <clears throat> Thank you for the report um, and it seems we're doing a sterling job. So uh, no worries there. Um, we, you mentioned training briefly, and it's mentioned in the report. Uh, so just if you could go into a bit more detail about what sort of training is given to new staff and uh, to ensure that, that, that there's a consistent sort of approach to the covert investigations. Obviously, it's quite rigid in how they're done because it's set out in policy, but <clears throat> different people may yes. approach things differently. Just to what, so keep it consistent. And, and what training is given and, and is that, have we, additional to that, have we taken on more staff recently? Has there been a change in staff and has sort of the pandemic and training their staff and operations to help train their staff been hampered by not meeting in person, for example? I mean, again, um, I think this comes down to, the, I suppose, the good way in which we work, which legal works for all the other service areas. Um, the training is provided by me on, on an annual basis, probably one year to 18 months. There's the generic training where every investigating officer is invited to that. But you're right, when a new member of staff will start within that period, uh, the question arises, well, how do they become aware? How do they become familiar with the processes and policies that we have in place? Well, again, it's down to, I suppose, the close working relationship that we have as officers. Um, I know most of the service managers and most of the service managers know me again, heads of service, and, and when a new person starts, it will be flagged up as part of their, I suppose, induction programme, that this is something that they need to undertake. That contact will be made with legal, and we will arrange uh, a bespoke couple of hours to sit down with that person to explain to them what the RIPA process is, to go through the training programme if it's necessary. Some officers come from other authorities where they may already have a level of knowledge or may have already had the RIPA, RIPA training there but they'll need to know still how we do it here because most you know some authorities do things slightly differently um, so we do have that close working relationship um it is something that we're aware of and it's something that between us and the various managers we work towards and ensure that any officer that's coming in in an investigatory role it's part of their training that this is what they need so they do need to ensure that they they have it. And, and, and ultimately, I suppose it's down to the managers themselves to ensure that their officers are appropriately trained. Um, and I'm sure that they have that themselves on their learning and training development programme, that this is something that they need to ensure that people uh, are aware of. Councillor Scam. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, hi, Nick. Yeah, um, my question is more or less covered because we didn't get your appendix A and B until 
a little bit late in the process. And the question was, who are the authorising officers? Who are they now? Are they specially trained, which I've already uh, uh, shown in the report and answered this morning. So just to say, Tom, all I would say, well, you know, in the recommendations, possibly congratulate you on a very good report by the inspector. And to pass on to your staff that we're very pleased with the report. OK. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, what, what is classed as regular surveillance? Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Uh, what is classed as regular surveillance? Um, in, in what context? Sir? I'm sorry, I, I don't... Um... Well, just in, in the notes we picked up, yeah. um, is there such a thing as, as regular surveillance, a day-to-day -day regular um... type of arrangement for it? I think the best way I can answer that question is, is I suppose, to look into... If, I'll try and think of a, of a scenario which I can look into that particular point. Um, mm. Internet use. So right. uh, looking at someone's Facebook social media profiles. Social so, media. I social see. media. So yep. you, can, you can have a, a scenario where generally, I mean, social media is it's a new, or it's still new because the law tends to catch up fairly slowly. Yep. Um, it, it's a new uh, aspect. It's a new concept for, with surveillance. Um, if you'd have asked me the question, probably uh, with regards to social media, five to 10 years ago, there was a, uh, the answer would be different to what it is now. Right. The general rule of thumb used to be, I used to imagine it had been a one in 10 instance. So if you're looking at somebody's social media profile once or twice, then it's generally okay. When you get to five, six, seven, eight, nine times, it becomes more regular and you're building up a profile of that individual. So that could classes sort of a regular social it's a break, media. breakdown from really what information you're picking up. Yes, it yeah. is. It's more about... Um, it's, it's a difficult scenario, but it's more about looking at what type... If, if you're building a profile of that individual as to what that individual does on a daily basis, then you can you, you can do that by in one of in many number of ways. One could be to actually monitor that person by actually watching them and looking at them and following them around, which would obviously be surveillance. Another one is to... Because generally, most people use their social media as if... You know, to, to broadcast to the world what they're doing. And... Right. They might have an appreciation that that broadcast is private between them and their friends, but unless they've got the security settings in place, it won't be private. It could be public. And as a public authority, you know, <laughs> our officers do will look at uh, social media on occasion because they will. I see. But it won't slip into the, I suppose, regular stroke. The, re the regular, the regular it's, major surveillance. Yes, yeah, so it's been used for more the than teams. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next one, Councillor Norman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nick, for your presentation. Um, as we all know, one of the worst antisocial activities is, is fly tipping. And I think some of our residents uh, may think that the council can have covert CCTV to try and stop or at least pick up um, people fly tipping, for example. Could you explain to us, um, and of course to the residents on Zoom, why we can't do this as, on a regular basis? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, th I think um, the, the general answer to that is that I think the council does carry out overt surveillance of, of locations. So there's two different ways of, to carry out surveillance. There's overt and there's covert. Covert is where the individual isn't aware that it's taking place. Overt is where the individual is aware that it's taking place. And the way that the council makes it over is to put signs up. So a number of laybys around the area, around the authorities' area, you probably see some signs which say images are being collected for criminal crime prevention purposes, and, and that will be possibly potentially in uh, fly fly tipping hotspots. And, and the reason that is there is, is so that anybody who decides to fly tip in that area will be aware that the cameras are there. To go to the wider, to the broader question as to why maybe the council doesn't use covert surveillance in, with regard um, those sort of offences. It's really, you've got to take the answer back to changes that came into the uh, legal position after 2012, 2013, where in, in essence, the government brought in changes and the, the uses of these type of activities were restricted to only the most serious criminal offences. And by that, I don't mean that fly tipping and offences aren't serious. What I mean is that there's a, there's a, a definition of what counts as a serious offence and it'll be an offence that carries with it a prison sentence of over six months in prison. Um, and so if it, if it meets that threshold, then yes, it's an activity that the authority 
can carry out covert surveillance in order to investigate. If it doesn't meet that threshold, then it won't be because it's not something that the authority um, can have the use of or the protection that the Ripper regime provides. Bearing in mind that the Ripper and Nipper, I use those abbreviations, don't enable the council to do anything. What it does is protect the council from a human rights stroke um, invasion of privacy argument, which can end up in a, an investigative powers tribunal or it can end up in the courts if somebody uh, alleges that we've breached their rights, their Article 8 rights. So there are limits on what we can do with regards uh, covert surveillance and the limits are there because there are legal limits as to what we can actually do in order to safeguard uh, members of the public's privacy. Um, but it, it's down to that ultimately. And, and the process that we have in place is, is that application process to an investigating, from an investigating officer to an authorising officer. And if the authorising officer applies the test and it meets the test, then it will go further. But again, it's not something that we can just do unilaterally. It's something that then has to go to the magistrate for a magistrate to approve. Um, but there are limits, unfortunately, to what we can do. OK, thanks, Nick. Um, do you have any examples then of um, instances where we would be able to use the Ripper and Iper, given that there's this six-month prison sentence um, notional issue? Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, the same restrictions don't apply um, to IPA, which is communications data. So one of the best examples I can give for our use of communications data is in flight tipping scenarios. Uh, for example, it's, it's the homeowner um, that, again, I use social media, the homeowner that, that goes on social media and sees man, an advert man with a van and they've got some waste that they need taken to the local tip, but they don't drive or they can't drive or they don't have a car. So it's man with a van, all it is is a telephone number. They use that, they phone that telephone number. The gentleman attends and says, I'll get rid of your waste for 50 pounds. And unbeknownst to the homeowner, that waste finds itself down uh, in a local, um, well, yeah, either in a 10 foot or, or in a lay by somewhere. Um, yeah. And within that waste, there may end up with some letters or something that links it back to that homeowner. So the investigation starts at the waste the officers will go through the waste and find the address. Then they'll go to the home and ask the homeowner, why is your waste in this uh, location? It's been fly tipped. The homeowner will then say, well, I answered a, a, an ad on, on social media, Facebook, man with a van, his number is 07XXX. And we telephone that number, but we have no way of knowing who that person is. They don't answer or they do answer and they say it's nothing to do with them. But don't give us the person their, their home address. Well, in that sort of scenario, what the investigating officer can do is use the IPA regime, so the IPA processes, to make the application through the National Anti-Fraud Network, NAFA, um, to OCTA, the Office of Communication Data Authorizations, and find the name and address of the person whose mobile phone number that is, because ostensibly that's the person who is flighted the waste. And so that's the person who the officers will want yeah. to yeah. speak to, or want to interview, potentially issue a fine or, or prosecute. So that's a, a, a process that, that we do carry out. That's something that the officers will do. And, and that will be across the board. Local authorities uh, across the country will use that same process, that same um, application process in order to find, well, it's, it's an investigative process to find the name of somebody where they will actually want to speak to. Um, there's no guarantee that person will come into an interview. There's no guarantee that person is the person who flights it the worst, but it's a person that the authority would like to interview to find out what do they know? Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, Councillor Green. Thanks, Chair. I'm not sure whether you'd be able to answer this. Um, I live on the border of Hull and East Riding. We have a piece of East Riding, um, Hull city land in the East Riding. I noticed two days ago there's a, a CCTV camera being put up in the East Riding facing this Hull City Council land. Do we give permission for East Right uh, for Hull City Council to put cameras within our uh, authority? Um, no, you're right. That's not something I can answer. Um, I, I don't really know what the answer to that would be. Um, I don't know if. Um, Maybe Paul. Paul. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Council, for the question. Um, in those cases where other partners may wish to use the council's street furniture to uh, 
uh, carry out their surveillance, um, then that request would come through to myself for approval. Right, I'm, okay. I'm afraid I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you the specifics um, about your the, the location that you mentioned. Right, okay, thank you. I might speak to you later. Thank you. Councillor Jeffries. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Nick, can you give us an example of a, a successful CCTV prevention of violence against women or, and or girls? Um, unfortunately, no, I, I, I can't. That wouldn't be something that would come under uh, my remit, so it wouldn't be anything that I would be aware of. If, if it assists, I can try and find that information out for you after the meeting and provide that information. But doesn't your CCTV also cover, isn't it there to prevent violence against? It, it, it is, but the actual use of CCTV is not something that comes under my uh, remit per se, or what my involvement in, it's more in the covert use of, of the cameras. So there is, we do have over CCTV cameras within um, the East Riding area, and those are over, so they're the signs, they're up, we can see them, the camera that was being spoken about, they're visible, and there's a sign there. You know, it slips into cover when it's used for a cover purpose. So, for example, we go walking around Beverly or Bridlington or wherever, and we can see cameras, and those cameras are watching us, but they're not watching us, they're watching everybody. It slips into being a cover technique when it actually is watching us, and it's, it's set for a... It, the design or the day it, they're told actually we're going to follow Nick King today and he's going to come into Beverly on this time and we're going to use all of our cameras to watch and see what Nick is doing during that day. That will become a cover, uh, say a cover surveillance of myself, not over. Um, the over use is, or if, so the general use is not something that I would be largely involved okay. with. That's something that would sit more, I suppose, the question under. Uh, for Matt Turner's team and the feedback, who has a more general oversight of, of the CCTV cameras, it's the cover aspects so of the use of that camera in the way that I set out to monitor me and my daily, what I'm doing today, it, it's, it's something that would more sit into my area. But I, I can definitely ask the question when I leave as to the use of CCTV cameras with regards to um, those types of activities and come back to you if I can find the answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Gateson. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Nick. Uh, I've got one question, but it's in three parts. First part is, uh, when did East Riding last use a covert human intelligence source and for what purpose? Um. That, unfortunately, is a question that I, I can't answer, only in the sense of I've been in the authority for coming up to 10 years now. Yep. Um, I've been dealing with Ripper as, as it was before, yep. then, as, uh, with Ripper after 2016, but Ripper since about 2014, 15, and, and we've not used uh, a covert human intelligence to source in that time period. So I can only answer from my own experience. The last 10 years then. Yeah, in my experience, it's not, not something that's been done while I've been... Um, looking after it. I can't say when it was because it will have been a bit before my well, time. For the last 10 years will do. Yeah. I mean, these things are regularly used by the police and the uh, uh, intelligence yeah. services. But so far as the local authorities are concerned, in particular East Yorkshire, it's just a dead letter, isn't it? Um, that's not uh, a way that I would describe it. But How would you describe it then? Um, it's, well, I can't speak for the investigating officers. I can't speak for the heads of service or service managers or group managers that would put in the request for use activity. I don't know why they don't. Um, I can't answer for them. I can just say that it's not something that as an authority we've used. Um, it may be um, that there are valid reasons as to why, as part of their investigations, they haven't felt the need to use a covert human intelligence source. It may be um, well, I don't know. I, I would be surmising, uh, it really, if I tried to answer as to why the council doesn't. Could, uh, could you agree with this, that it's uh, an available power that's never exercised um, in your 10 years experience? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't put it in those terms. What I would say is it's, available, it's an available power that is there uh, for use where it's deemed appropriate to be used. And at the moment, it would appear that the group managers who authorise that activity and, and the 
heads of service don't feel it appropriate to offer them to you. No, I'm, not, I'm not aware of uh, any activity. Not appropriate for the last 10 years. I, I couldn't answer as to why it's not used. I don't, I don't honestly know. I, I don't have okay. uh, any um, role in authorising or not authorising any activity. My role is to provide uh, the advice where it's deemed potentially this is what something's happened, or to attend court to make the application. Yes. Um, so I can answer to say that we've not. Um, I don't know why. Right. Move on to the second question. There was very similar. When was the last time this authority used uh, diverted surveillance technique um, in the last 10 years? Again, I can only, I can only answer in, in the 10 years, and, yeah. and I do not believe that we have. So again, that's a power it is. which is never used. Um, Probably in 10 years. It, it would appear to be the case, yes. Uh. Finally, communications data. Um, hope for better luck here. Uh, but I noticed from your report that there'd be no applications in the first 12 months. Um, when was the last application in the last 10 years? And what were the circumstances? I don't know the dates. I, it, we have made applications in the last 10 years. I, I don't know the dates, and I wouldn't be able to tell you the circumstances of the last one. Um, but that's some information I will be able to find out and provide. Well, not, not, not troubling with, with dates, but just give us an idea as to the circumstances, if there have been these applications. Um, well, I, I can't give you the circumstances of the last one until I know which one the last one was, and I wouldn't know which one the last one was until I'm able to check the records and find out which one it was, and then I'll be able to provide you the circumstances. It would more than likely, um, through experience, be in relation to flight it being flight it worse, that's what it would more than likely be, but I don't know without checking. So I would have to check the records that are kept. Can you give us an idea then of how often these applications have come across your desk? Um, you know, once a year, once every three years, once a month, just to give yeah. us a clue. Well, they don't come across my desk in that way. It's not something that, that would come across. It would come only, to your attention. It would, it would only come to my attention if uh, an authorising officer has authorised activity. So before it even came to our attention, there may be many occurrences, many occasions where an authorised, where an investigating officer has spoken to one of their managers or to one of the authorising officers about it being brought to legal attention and it's been dismissed as it's, we're not going to carry out that type of covert activity. Um, so no, I, I can't, because you would be talking about something in the past and I, I couldn't tell you when the last one was because I don't know off the top of my head. Not even roughly? No. Um, Sorry, it's, not, it's not information that is readily available to me, something I would have to go away and find that information out. Yeah, very well, thank you. Uh, Councillor Scouse. Yeah, just to follow on from what Councillor Gatesville just said, we, we have agreed that our, next, that our last work programme for the next year, because of the lack of activity that Nick's involved in, that instead of him coming and presenting and giving a long report, uh, we'll have a briefing note. Um, so that goes in the recommendations. I think, uh, you know, um, does all the committee agree with that? And does Nick think that would be a good idea? Excellent idea, Brian. Yep. Right. OK, we can put that in recommendations with, uh, with Nick's approval. Uh, not that you're not uh, wanted, Nick. <laughs> Recommendation approved. <laughs> um, you know, a view, a view of lack of activity, lack of anything going on um, in the last 10 years, um, while there's the briefing note to say, well, since last year, there's been no further action, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that would suffice the committee. If the committee agrees, anybody disagrees, uh, please say so. Disagreements? No. Is there a requirement for Nick to report to the committee in person? Do you have to report to us in person on a yearly basis, or is that just when the policy changes? The, no, there is a, a requirement for for the council to bring to the, the bring to the council's attention as uh, so officers to bring to the attention the use of, of covert surveillance techniques. Um, it's something that historically we've done in, in this way, mm. rather than a report to full council. Um, but it is something that was raised with the inspector when the inspector came in. In December um, by uh, Matthew Buckley and, and the inspector agreed that it doesn't necessarily need to be 
this type of, of, of presentation or report, it could be a briefing now, and which is why it makes sense uh, given the lack of use and given the lack of, of, of use. Of it is something we do have any changes to the policy do need to be brought to uh, the council, but it yeah. doesn't make sense. It's not something, it's some, we have to bring it to the council's attention, but it doesn't, it's not something that necessarily has to be in this format. So uh, a briefing that would comply with everything we have to comply with in the same That's, sense that you coming here yeah. is is complying and even the investigating yeah. investigation or the inquiry or whatever it was said that you don't have to come here you just have to let us know what's going on etc i i wouldn't i can't see a problem with a briefing that in no, that's yeah. the latest advice from, yeah. from the inspector yes i mean okay. the, the reason it was set up in this way again it's all based on advice that, that we get when the inspectors mm. come and uh, the latest advice from the inspector was that this is not necessary okay. uh, a briefing note would suffice that's and information if, if that's the advice of the inspector then i can't see any issues with it okay. uh paul you want to come in on this yeah thank you if it's helpful on the 7th of july this committee has invited the Trading Standards Service to attend you um, and describe their services, one of which is use of um, human intelligence. In the past, they would, uh, for example, test uh, use test purchases for un selling of underage, uh, alcohol to underage um, people. Um, and you may wish to ask and challenge the officers at that time, how do they carry out that um, get that intelligence without using um, covert human intelligence in the future. So there's a bit of a link there, Chair, that you may wish to explore with the training standards officers right. when they come to you on the 7th of July. Thank you. Right, if uh, there's no more questions, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank Mr Nick King for his attendance and the contribution to today's meeting. Um, can, can I just, uh, it's probably worth thanking Paul Bellotti as well yeah. for his contribution on on, on the other topics as well. Yeah. Albeit he's only said a little bit. I'd just like to thank him as well. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, right, <sorry. laughs> oh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Well, you're after Councillor Birch. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Right. Uh, well, we move on now to item number seven, which is the work programme, and uh, that includes item uh, eight and nine. I'll hand over to you. Please. Yep. Um, it really, number seven is just for your information. Um, it's just the items that you've seen this year. Um, at number eight, it's the draft uh, work programme for 22, 23. Um, I've got some changes already because um, I've, I've had notification uh, that there's some people can't attend some of these meetings. So this is subject to change and it's going to um, overview management on 7th of June now, not um, the end of March. Or, or April, or is it 7th of... Oh, sorry, it's going to... Seven, yeah, 7th of seven, April, seven April, it's, April, it's going um, to um, overview management. Uh, I've taken on board Paul's um, suggestion that we include a question in there for or, on the scope of the, the Trading Standards Service, so I'll add that. Um, we've also had a suggestion that we invite... Um, was it Chief Inspector Derek Hussain? With Darren Downs to the first meeting uh, in May, um, and it's just really just to ask for your comments. If you've got anything else to add, just just let me know. And linking in slightly to item nine as well, um, we've had a um, notification that a report's going to cabinet. It's actually going to cabinet now on the seventh of June. Um, Apparently, there's some significant changes to the affordable rent policy, and there is a, um, a recommendation from Nicholas Swalski, the officer, that uh, you do scrutinise it before it goes to Cabinet. Um, so if you're all in agreement with that, um, and obviously to meet, meet the Cabinet deadline, we need to bring it to the 19th of May meeting, so I'll need to add that one to your work programme <laughs> as well. I know, I know we've got a couple of big topics on that, but um, it, it, uh, I don't think it'll take too long yeah. for that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. It, is yeah. it is important. So I think we should yeah. hear what she has to say. Yeah. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you. Right, if there's no further items, uh, I don't see anybody with anything. Uh, meeting closed. Yeah. Well done, Vice Chair.